Okay, so also, if you go to, um, if everyone goes, to, or whoever will, feels like they want to help out here, and if you go to the uh, linuxplumbersconf.org uh, website, uh, you'll see a little note on the left side, and one of the menu options is going to be uh, etherpads. Click on etherpads, it lists all the etherpads for all the microconferences. There's going to be a real-time one. I'm going to soon have it up on that monitor. Um, but I'm not going to be taking the notes. I'm hoping someone else will be able to take notes. So it's uh, more people, anyone could log in and take notes, and it will be very useful if we have more than one person doing it. Um, but with that said, um, Julia and Darren are going to start off with uh, LibRTPI. So can everybody hear us okay? Mic check. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, hello. cool. Um, so Julie and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of pthread convars, what the problems were, how we got them fixed, how they got unfixed, how we're refixing them, and where we're going to go from there. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, the, the convars back in 2009 had uh, the potential for a unbounded priority inversion on what was an internal non-priority inheritance data lock. So the convar structure itself had an internal lock that protected some of its internal state, and that lock itself was not priority inheritance aware. So even if you paired the convar with a PI mutex, you could still end up in a priority inversion on that data lock. Um, so we prepared um, uh, changes to GWebC, and we implemented the kernel side Futex ReQPI mechanisms, which solved this problem. Um, and we were socializing that with GWebC. There's the bug reference here. You can read through it in all of its gory detail, as well as the uh, paper that we submitted to the Real Time Linux Workshop 11. Um, all that detail is there. Unfortunately, oh, and what I should say is uh, a lot of folks that care about real-time and are shipping real-time Linux distributions have been using this out-of-tree patch to GWebC um, since 2009. But the fix is still not upstream. Now, in 2011, um, somebody raised a bug about ordering with respect to... Why is this fix upstream? Getting there. Um, so in 2011, someone opened a bug against GWebC about the ordering constraints of the POSIX standard and the implementation in libc. Part of that was uh, around spurious wakeups and how glibc tried to mitigate them. But the end result was a change in the interpretation, well, a change to the standard and an interpretation of the standard, which is summarized in this quote up here. Um, which basically provides some stricter ordering with respect to which waiters can wake when relative to signals. What does it mean to be waiting before um, versus waiting after? Uh, the, the race condition that was raised is when, if you have a bunch of waiters that have gone to wait on a, on a convar, as they're starting to wake back up and they take an internal lock, something after the signal can start to wait, get hung up on that same lock and end up stealing one of the signals meant for the old one. So this led to a five-year conversation um, on LibC Alpha and the Austin group with respect to CONVARS. And the end result is that the current since 2.25 implementation of CONVARS and LibC no longer make use of Futex ReQ. So what that means is the old fix is no longer viable. It doesn't apply, and it can't apply because it's dependent upon the Futex structures and system calls and that vicarious locking that all happens inside the kernel. Um, so it no longer applies, but that leaves us in the situation where the folks that have been shipping this out of tree patch since 2009 can now no longer upgrade their libc past version 2.25 which for something as core as libc is kind of a nasty place to be in with respect to security vulnerabilities and things like that. So we, we've been at this for nine years. We figured maybe it's time to take a step back. How do we solve the immediate problem, let people upgrade their C libraries? So um, a year ago, two years ago, a year ago? Yeah, so about a year ago, um, we met in Prague and we decided to come up with the idea of a 
simple, narrow in scope implementation of priority inheritance uh, aware condition variables. The idea here being, let's address what we believe to be the specific real-time use case of CONVARs in a way that people can use them independently from libc, which decouples their dependency on libc versioning. Um, and so this uh, project is as, uh, at, well, af after today, as soon as we merge the counters branch, um, should be considered basically functional. Um, but what we'd like to do today is verify our assumptions, use cases, um, with input from you, uh, users of, of with real-time, uh, why can't I talk? Uh, real-time real use cases, workloads, help us make sure we're not uh, misunderstanding your needs or the expectations. Um, so really quickly with respect to librtpy, um, it does not reuse pthread condition variables or mutex structures. So we re-implemented these initially using system calls um, and counters. So Sebastian is here. Um, so most of this work in terms of the implementation of convars and mutexes, uh, Sebastian and Julia were doing that on a mountain someplace. Um, and <laughs> mostly Sebastian. Um, but we've, we've uh, integrated that work into the counters branch, which we can merge after today. Um, what this does is it enforces some of those use cases, those real-time use cases. Uh, pthreads allow you to not necessarily be, uh, to not necessarily associate a mutex with a convar. We disallow that, it's part of the structure now. You have to pair them when you create them. They are only prio inherit. There's no opportunity to be none or sealing. Um, there's no robust, there's no uh, error check, there's no recursion, there's um, no cancellation. Um, so those are many of the ways in which we limited the, the use case that we're concerned with. Um, and the waiters will wake up in highest priority FIFO order. And the GitHub link is there. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to have Julia lead us in a discussion about expected behavior. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about how glibc currently implements uh, convar. So this is after uh, Torvald's uh, rewrite. Um, he changed how the convars are implemented um, to satisfy the, the new POSIX interpretation. Um, so here's how it functions, and I'll walk through this example. This is actually his example, so the credit uh, goes to him. Um, so the top row indicates that uh, the W's, the two boxes, the W's, those are two waiters that are, are queued uh, on a conditional, conditional variable, and they're assigned a group. Um, now, by default, when a task goes to wait on a convar, uh, they are put into what is here G2, um, but that is a group that indicates that they're not eligible to be woken up by a signal. Um, and then at some point later in the second row, we have our first signal S1, um, that is, uh, that occurs. And at that point, during the signal delivery path, we move all the tasks that are in the currently ineligible group, uh, we move those into an eligible group, um, and then one of the tasks is chosen from the current, the, the now eligible group. So in this case, S1, this, this arrow that I have here um, indicates that, that W1 is the thread that actually is chosen to be woken. And so now on the bottom row, um, at some point later, we have a third waiter that comes along. And the third waiter sees that the, the, the current eligible group uh, is not completely depleted. Uh, and so what it does is it queues itself on G2, which as I mentioned, G2 just means that it's, it's an uneligible, um, uneligible for being woken up. Um, and so when the S2 is delivered, uh, it will actually go and look and deliver the signal to the list of eligible waiters in G1. And so at this point, it would choose W2. Um, hopefully that's clear. If not, I can answer questions about that. Um, I want to talk about the inversion case that's problematic for RT in this implementation. Um, so in the, the inversion case that's problematic for RT is in the case where the W3 here that actually gets queued um, in the uneligible list is a high priority waiter. And so therefore, S2 should actually wake up W3 because it happens to be um, the highest priority waiter. 
Um, and uh, as it exists now in the implementation, uh, this just doesn't happen. So there's an inversion scenario as it, as it exists now in the implementation in glibc. Uh, that's something that we yeah. want Julie? to solve for libRTPI, yeah. Uh, question, uh, has there been complaints about this in the real-time community? Or is this something we just noticed? I mean, where was the notice of this issue? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. ready? Oh. Watch heads. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so Torvalds came to um, the real-time Linux workshop in Berlin um, where we discussed the entire situation around priority inheritance and confars. And when he described his new scheme that was POSIX compliant, um, I already told him that this was broken for real-time. Um, at the time, so he knew this before it landed in, in GLIPC. Um, it's in the bug stated that way as well. It basically says there's no known solution to achieve this with the requirements of the semantics and the existing futex operations. It's part of the bugzilla. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, did anyone in the real-time community complain about this, or is this so Well, we complained then to him that right. this was not good for us. He was like, meh. Well, my, my, I'm just interested in, is, was there any, who's the users of Convars in this situation? I mean, yeah, Darren was there. Um, yeah. we so there are people are. I so, think. so, I mean, I presented with Torvalds at that time. Um, we were active on the discussion on the, on the Bugzilla and things, but their priority is POSIX compliance. Yeah. And basically what we're talking about here is non-POSIX. So, um, Maybe this one. Yeah. Yep. It's this one over here. I was <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> I was going to ask: Are you dependent on a on a uh, preempt RT for either of these? You know, your your lib R RT PI. Oh, uh, no. Okay, uh, so not, this not is true regardless of. So RT so to be. Speaking from a distro perspective, I mean, I'm, I'm an RT guy, but I also have to think about RHEL. We probably need to add a libRTPI package, I guess. I, I would say that depends on the output of this discussion. Okay. Right? <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm getting rid of this. Here. So, so you, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I, I, so one question that I have um, is in reading the POSIX interpretation, I do actually in this case believe that W3 is an eligible, is eligible to be woken up according to the spec, but not uh, as it's currently implemented in glibc. So that might be one potential avenue we go down is, is, is it possible to implement a different scheme in libRTPI um, that can support that properly? Uh, I don't know that we know the answer yet, but. My, my thought on that, because since Julie and I met last, I spent the last two hours rereading the links up here. Um, I, I think that the clarifying statement here um, is, is intending to limit that interpretation to a specific ordering relative to signal, um, whether it's pthread con signal or pthread con broadcast. I would not say that this is cut and dry in any <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> interpretation. So uh, I think a question is about expected behavior. So if this was your real-time application, um, at the time of, oh, I, actually I take that back, I'm sorry. With respect to Julia's comment that S2 can wake up w, W3, I agree. It, it would be only whether or not um, S1 could wake up W3 in the race condition that I specified earlier, that I, that's a violation. So actually, I take it back, we're in agreement, sorry. Um, so the question to the, to the room is, for a real-time application in which W3 is the highest priority task, which waiter should S2 wake? <laughs> 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 
So Cl Clark says W3. I would have picked the highest priority and I would have inserted it because it was higher than anybody in the waiting group. I would, I would have thought you'd have said, oh, insert it in the waiting group because it is the highest, hi higher priority than anybody that's eligible over there. But that's just me. Anyone have a different view, Sean? Hello. Oops, Sean. <laughs> What is, what is it about uh, group two that made it uh, W3 ineligible? Uh, because it, it came after uh, S1. So S1 transitioned the, the, un the uneligible group into to now become a, an eligible group, right? Meaning that all the waiters after S1 are now being queued in the uneligible state. Does that it, make sense? It's an implementation detail with respect to the waking to the wake ordering of futexes, so they chose to use two different futex words, and they use signal to break that grouping. Correct. Um, yeah. uh, okay, so let me reverse the question. Is there any reason why W2 uh, would be, uh, or should be wake, woken up by S2? By S2? Right, right. so that's, that, that is also the, the, the question. Um, I don't believe that the POSIX specification requires you to do so. And our thinking is that from a real-time perspective, we are all very comfortable with starving lower priority things. So there's not a fairness question here that we're really worried about. Mm -hmm. um, this is what you know the FIFO scheduler is all about. You schedule something at FIFO 99, you're gonna starve things. If you queue high priority tasks on CONVARS all day long, you're gonna starve the low priority ones. And our, our assertion is that that's okay. So I think that the you know, concern here with uh, waking up uh, W2 first would be that uh, it could introduce latency for uh, W3. That right. wouldn't be acceptable, yep. right? Yep, that would be a priority that, inversion. That, I think that that is end of story here because. Okay. So what so you're talking about is, is changing the rules for where you queue the waiter. Correct. You're, you're talking about consulting the priority and, and what we're, state we're just you're, yeah. We're mentioning that, that this, the libRTPI implementation is going to, to order the waiters differently. Okay. Or at least we're asserting that this is what libRTPI should do, and we're checking with the room to ensure that you all feel the same way. I, I'm in agreement okay. with changing the rules. All right. So basically, if you uh, link your uh, code with uh, libRTPI, then it, do, it changes the rules. Does it, how does it use the same so interface basically? Or no, we did end up changing the the interface wrapper, and we thought about trying to use LD preload. We opted for this instead, and one of the reasons is it's a great way to ensure that you've made the change because it won't compile otherwise. Um, so it's a good way to make sure you've caught everything. Um, it also eliminates the corner cases where you can do weird things with attributes. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it narrows the API to the specific use case, which um, uh, I think further specifies what we're trying to solve. Well, I love this thing, actually. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm thinking to say, maybe from a system design point of view, uh, looking into the uh, real-time system, say that, uh, 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 why do we have two different uh, uh, threads with different priority waiting on the same convar and uh, uh, the convar normally is notified by some uh, uh, server, uh, which means something is ready, so the server is providing something to them. So uh, if we look into another way that uh, shouldn't the different threads uh, block on different, uh, uh, different threads with different priority block on different convars so that uh, we can have association of the server thread, which will have similar priority as the priority while as the thread while waiting on the counter bar. Uh, yeah, oh. otherwise, because uh, say, a, you have uh, uh, three different priority threads waiting on the same counter bar, mm -hmm. and uh, what will be the priority of the server thread? Uh, I think it's a system uh, design thing, because it's different from a mutex priority inheritance, which, uh, uh, which you have a hierarchy. But the convar itself is uh, you do not hold anything. Uh, the association between the waiter and the provider are kind of uh, indirect. I think it's a really good question and a debate that you can have at the application level. But I think from a core uh, sort of locking infrastructure and mechanism, it's not the kind of thing, 
if we were to make a statement about that, we would be over-specifying in addition to the POSIX standard. And our uh, goal here was to provide an underlying mechanism that you could use for whatever you choose to be your architecture. Uh, yes, so, so my point is that to say, uh, because I heard you guys provide something which is uh, not uh, POSIX compliant right now. So the question would be that, uh, uh, do we want to do that, or do we want to uh, solve it in the, the system design level? Yeah, I, th I think there is a, like what Darren said, I think there is a, um, perhaps a reevaluation should be done at the application level to see whether or not CONVARS is actually a suitable mechanism for synchronization and whether or not that can be avoided. Um, but there are applications in production right now that make use of CONVARS and may be unknowingly broken, um, or maybe knowingly so. Um, uh, but they need a way to, uh, you know, be released from the version constraint of the old glibc. So, so we are running shy on time, yep. so I'm just yep. going to advance us to the last slide, which um, maybe we'll just leave here um, uh, if Stephen wants to pull us off the stage. Um, but this is a little bit about future work. The question marks are things where um, we're, we're interested in input, so feel free to type it into the etherpad uh, or, or let us know. Um, and then the bottom two items are just things we know we need to um, implement and work on. So any, any yeah. final thing? No. Okay. Thank you. All right, all right. thanks, thanks all. Okay, um, so I'm, I have a small side project um, and I have a couple of questions on that and I just present what the problem is. So the background is we have application or one application which um, is using Xenon IDs uh, at this moment. And the reason is, or the, the composition of the, the project is you have an application and inside the application there's a thread, one or two threads with real time priority and the main problem we have is there um, those guys are using a, a few libraries and they're stacked and they don't know the internal details of those libraries which means if they call some function they might do something which is not really good for real time so and in the Xenomai case it's um, the, the system is working in this way that you have two schedulers basically and your real-time thread is running in the real-time domain and as soon as you do something calling something which the, this real-time domain can't provide it will be transferred to the other scheduler side or to the normal Linux side and this transfer if you transfer this thread from one context to another one you get an, um, a signal and or you can configure you get a signal associated with a stack trace and this is a very very useful debug tool for those guys because they find out basically okay i'm i'm doing stuff and i'm calling this function and okay this is not okay and so the thing is they would like to transfer uh, port the application to preempt rt but at this point they really lack this feature they really want that and I was thinking about how how to emulate this with the current means we have in the kernel. Yeah, it's, purely it's purely debugging. Do you want it? Ready? Ready. Yeah. What? <laughs> so if it's purely debugging, um, you might abuse the tracer and eventually do some so uh, some some better um, conditionals or BPF or something like that. 
mentioned that. Yeah, that's the title of it. Nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, let's skip that one. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> You sure he didn't pay you for that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see the title? Y you know. Beepcap is not an RT debugging tool. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's the name of the no, title. No, I actually didn't read the schedule <laughs> at all. <laughs> and that's, you, propos you proposed that title. You know that? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, that was years ago. <laughs> Yeah, so what I did was basically I attached it at the syscall uh, trace point and added a small BPF which checks the, 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 the thread ID and if it's the one I'm interested in, I do like looking at the resources. And the thing is, what I, the previous slide was, um, it's the syscalls are not a uh, black-white thing to decide. Sometimes it's okay to call one which might sleep and sometimes not. You can't decide that basically just on the syscall level. And obviously there are resources where you might um, can access during setup phase very easily and then later you shouldn't do anything else. So just one file script is okay to read and write but the other one don't do that. That might be something. So it's, it's the thing is what that means you can't, um, which brings me to that slide basically with BPF currently at this point you have to write uh, either with really low level needs uh, a program, which makes no fun at all, or you use the tool chain to build your program and then load it to the kernel. But the, currently the tool chain is working for x86 and ARM64. Any device like ARM uh, uh, 32 bits won't work. At this point, yes. Um, I don't know about other architecture. I mean, I don't care about them right now, but <laughs> it's... Yeah, but that's a solvable problem. But let me go back to that other thing you said. Uh, you don't know whether the read or write operation is actually safe, safe or not. So how, it, how the hell does Cinemai know that? Um, yeah, so there's, it's not perfectly that as well. So they do not catch all cases. Um, but what they can, they know basically when they um, need help of access basically outside of their domain. So they have some internal stuff done. I, I don't <coughs> know the details. Okay. Um, and as soon as they, they know, okay, we need the proper Linux environment to do something and they switch out of okay. the <coughs> domain. Yeah. Then yeah, I remember. Now, what we could do is if we have tracer points, I mean, one thing is, or we could hook into, for trace events, what we talked at um, in Edinburgh about things like the right, if you grab a uh, writer lock, which we said a writer lock has no PI. I mean, well, I mean, they PI among writer locks, but they could be stuck unbounded for uh, the, the readers. from readers. So that's something you never want to do. You never want to call a writer lock. But if we could put in a trace point or something, or a F-trace hook, in fact, that if it's, you know, you hook it there so and then actually have a module. So you don't really have to worry about, this will work among across all mm. um, architectures. You hit a, a, write, a write lock, you check to see is this task a real time task that doesn't want to do this, boom, send the signal right so, from there. So the thing, the main problem I um, currently see with, or this, what BPF solves right now is that you can have this kind of condition when you want to send a signal built depending on your application. So if you have F-trace or anything r running, either you consume all the data and have to do the processing. No, 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 this is not uh, exactly. Is that so what do you propose? You can actually inject it, also you have a trigger. So basically yeah, but you trigger it on, on a condition. Yeah, but how, f how complex can you make that condition? Pretty complex. Okay. And uh, it's even gonna get more so. So I mean, there's, I mean, if you're just thinking about. I mean, it, that's purely a mechanism problem, I, and I don't worry about the mechanism. I more worry about the semantics. Okay. So where do you put your 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 uh, trace points in, or can you reuse existing ones and sufficiently mm -hmm. enough cover the cases you care about? Yeah, I think. So at the very end, whether you need whether you 
use BPF or whatever other random um, mechanism that's pure implementation detail. Yeah. That's solvable. You also, the t tool chain thing is solvable. So the, the main problem is that you want to have a well-defined semantical list of conditions where you say this should trigger. Yeah, that, that's one of and, the big and problems. That's if you want to extend it to something like read-write and then differentiate between actual dangerous reads and uh, safe reads, um, yeah, that's going to be tough. Well, is there any chance that, well, is read uh, grabbing a reader lock, is that dangerous? I mean, is it we, uh, is the reader lock or the readers, It's they could starve a writer, correct? Or it's not fair. So if a writer's waiting, do readers block? Right. So, so, that, so the, only, the only problematic side is the writer side. Right. So I'm saying is so if, it's if, not you, if you're a reader and the writer is holding the lock, then you boost the writer yeah. and get it out of the way. Right. I mean, this still can be problematic if the writer is actually sleeping on something else, which might happen. Yeah, and also if a writer is sleeping on another writer, that we have to have, we have to be able to trigger that too. Yeah, that's that's uh, bad luck. What's <laughs> the problem with being a little over optimistic here? And if if there's doubt, send the signal. I mean, this is a yeah, of course. Answer. I mean, yeah. you always can say if. I guess my only question is, is if we say this is a questionable system, have a system a call, and send um, a signal. Oh, give me that. <laughs> so I got one right here. So so if there's doubt. You know, if, it, if it's a fuzzy yeah. system call, are we going to be overwhelmed with false positives if we well, just send the signal? So you could, uh, um, one thing is y you probably, what you can do or what we can do right now is you have a setup phase where you allocate resources and you know which one you want to talk to. And then you basically tell, okay, these file descriptors are safe to, to read and write to. And if you call read to anything else in all the file script, you just say, oh, that's not good. Hmm? Yeah, but that's the, then you need, need application interaction with that. Yeah, that's. Yeah, because you have to figure out the yeah. file descriptors. Yeah, I, I'm still you thinking. You could that base it on the, on the, because the, the file descriptors where you actually think they are safe or usually special device files where for your magic custom driver or something yeah. like that. Um, so you could um, do it the other way around and say um, you trace the whole thing and you just get events for into the into your magic uh, uh, supervisor application yeah. uh, on open because with open you get the, the path and on the return from open you get the file descriptor number so you can do the association based on the on the path okay. and and then you, you get whatever for deaf magic you get file descriptor 7 and you say everything except 7 is going to throw a signal okay yeah so that might be workable. Yeah, but then how do you pass that information? I mean, the application's running. How do you, like, the open? I mean, th does BPF or mechanisms have a thing of transferring? Uh, BPF can trap here. <laughs> so BPF has internal storage. You can do all sorts of things with that. Right. So for example, we can use the file system backing device, right? And if you know you're accessing a particular file system and it is not a MFS or something, you're obviously going to block, right? Yeah, but, so but you can't, you don't have that information at the Cisco level. Not at you the Cisco level. You have to go level. deeper. Yeah, not at the but Cisco level, but basically the file system open can probably check that, right? So it doesn't have to be at the Cisco level, right? I mean, I don't know about BPF. Don't look at from the BPF perspective or generic perspective. Today we have a lot of warnons in the kernel, right? Similarly, like for example, if it's a RT task and if it's going to block, we can have some some. Yeah, checks. but then you have to sprinkle that stuff, that debug stuff all over the place. It's That's it's 
we can we could do that. I, I think you can actually do it at the Cisco level because you can in BPF translate a file descriptor to the struct file and the struct file has all that crap in it. Right. Yeah. Don't just look at the debugging perspective also if this is useful in other applications also, right? Like you can catch the problem much ahead, right? Instead of happening in uh, production. Say throw a warning instead of uh, instead of trying to crash or stop. Just right. say, hey, this is bad. Yeah. Go look at this. Right. Okay. So this behavior is bad, right? It right. will not cause a problem right away, but it will potentially cause a problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe if you have trigger warnings. Um, I feel like we've, <laughs> I feel like we're kind of stuck up on the, the file I.O. portion of the, of the system call space, but there are other system calls that are, that might also be problematic for RT, like the POSIX right. CPU timers and like all sorts of other insane things. Um, so, yeah, I of mean. Of course, I mean, you, if you start the, the whole debugging thing, you have to define which system calls you consider safe. Sure. And everything else is unsafe. So yeah, by default, everything is unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a lot of warnings. <laughs> it was also not just uh, implementing it at the system call level, but also basically finding a way to say, okay, if you've come up with a new thing, how easy is it to add a new uh, test case? Yeah. I guess that's where the more issue is, and I guess that's where you've had trouble, is like at the, the simplicity of basically adding new, I mean, yeah, implementation is, you know, the, might be just say, oh, it's just implementation detail, and so it could be done. But having a you know, mechanism that could easily add new test cases is what we want. Right. And that's why I was thinking, like, you know, I'm not sure if system call level is the best level. If we just look into the, the code paths that there's trace points that we get attached to and say, if this is triggered by this guy, you might be able to trigger right away. Um, down a deeper call, why are we stuck at just looking at system calls? Since there's trace points all over the kernel. Yeah, the question is, are they in the right places? I think you should they might. To, to Steven. Yeah. He seems like he's got the solution. So. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, already, I already got signed a uh, patch or code I had from the last microconference that I, I almost got done during that con microconference. <laughs> okay, that's basically all. Stuff. And I mean, yeah, that's obviously just for syscalls. Um, eventually, want to do also like glibc interfaces like malloc and so on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but those you can inject, you probably put just int threes or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 but you can uh, do u probes on that. Yeah, yeah, that was the idea. That's why I would like to go further with that and in stay away from BPF. Yeah, but yeah. BPF is like ooh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can you can do u probes with eBPF. <laughs> so. Um, one thing which was, okay, is, is kind of, because it's a very fast moving target, uh, documentation is far behind the code base. Um, Daniel Borkman told me he has written up a lot of the, on the documentation side, so it should be get better. I had a hard time to get the, the signals out via perf. It was very interesting problem. Um, and then I, I did some measurements on my machine, uh, and you can show that maybe. Um, so um, what you see here is a histogram. Um, the, the blue one left is uh, just a system call. I think it's a uh, get timer ID. And you see it takes, I don't know, 270 micros uh, nanoseconds. And the distribution, as you can see, is very tight, so it's I really had a very fast access. And then it just enabled um, the trace point. This is the, the yellow one or the orange one. And it was 200 and I 340 nanoseconds per call. So this is just the overhead you get uh, if you enable the uh, trace point. And if this is all in a tight loop, everything and disable it and, and you know, if, if you have a normal system running, it's way over the distribution is, you can't really read anything from that anymore. And then what I did is the, 
the red one was attaching basically uh, to the sys call entry. So this was just reading um, with ftrace <coughs> stuff out. And, and then I compared uh, what happens if I have a, a big, a, a big a larger BPF. This is the green, the last one. This was with 390 instructions. And, and you can do the math and you figure out it's about one cycle uh, in per, uh, per instruction I, uh, you need for, for BPF, which makes kind of sense because. And, <coughs> and this is another reason why I, would, I try not to hook just to the system calls because with the system calls, when you enable a system call event, it goes the slow path. The, I mean, system calls aren't traced. Yeah. Uh, they have the P trace trampoline that, you know, when it goes, when you enter from a system call or exit, it says, oh, we have work, we'll jump and do this all extra work before. So there's an overhead, I mean, that first yellow thing is probably just the overhead of the P-trace yeah, code, yeah. jump uh, enabling yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, this yeah. Is, so you see the slow path here, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, if we are injecting inside, not at the system call level, but lower, you at least lose that uh, large jump, and maybe at least it'll speed things yeah. up a bit. But yeah, but on the other hand, if you look at the overhead of BPF, yeah, it's at the end, the, the, the noise is <coughs> of, the, of the extra trampoline in the syscall is just yeah. noise. So. Well. The, um, the BPF uh, uh, was attached at um, the green, green, yes. The green is, yeah. Uh, the, green's, the, the green is with the 300 instruction or 400 okay. instruction, and uh, the yellow one was with two instructions. Ah, oh, and the red one is if I'm done, I'm using ftrace to print Wait. into the buffer. So that's the ftrace ring buffer. Yeah, and this, you the see the and print. And the other one is the per, is that with the yes. perf in? So that one you s you get basically the f, uh, the print yeah. f overhead into yes. the buffer. You see the, creating yeah. the string, which is expensive. Well, it shouldn't create a string. I mean, it's right, right in binary. Uh, whatever. <laughs> so this is, this is basically just the BPF enabling without e doing anything. This was just return. Mm -hmm. So go into the BPF and return yeah. it. That. So uh, and this, uh, the, the blue one is just the bare minimum, uh, just without anything. Um, uh, would you need our, uh, really need our using the, the signal to or signaling the, the user space or just, uh, let's say, uh, tracing and check the data afterwards? Uh, so at that point, um, it's not important to be fast reporting. I mean, if it comes a bit later, delayed, doesn't matter. I mean, you just need to get the information, okay, you did, this is the trace, you get done something which yeah. is not correct. So I don't care at that point if it's a signal or any other means. Yeah, in that case, you can, Maybe you can uh, put the uh, trace point or some event in a uh, blocking func uh, function and uh, just dump the uh, stack, uh, you know, uh, uh, kernel stack and the user stack mm -hmm. in a uh, tracing uh, buffer. Yeah. That would be uh, enough for yeah, uh, yeah, checking. Yeah, basically that's what you get if you have the BPF and it, it can call, like, I think, um, I can't remember the function name where it just uh, dumps the, the, the stack trace into yeah. the ring buffer, which is very handy. I mean, from from the, the interface and everything, it's it's the thing I want to have. But I really got annoyed by this uh, tooling situation for userland. But if <coughs> but if if it's if it's the right decision, uh, right the way to go, okay, we're gonna fix that thing. Uh, I think <laughs> so basically, the. Uh, uh, the result of this discussion here is, yeah, continue that way. Yeah, yeah that's, I, I wanted to, to check if I'm on the right path. Here. Yeah, yeah, so I think you'll probably just, just get you and then play around with either system calls or just basically, yeah, you're on the right path, just get yeah, some fix notes it, and fix some fix things you could try. Yeah, and yeah. Fix, the, fix the tooling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. more work. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you've got a work package now. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. You volunteered. Smallest computer. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's like, I should get one of those. This thing looks awesome. Yeah. Volunteer him. What? We'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Did we delete the net data? Yeah, you've got volunteers. Yeah, you just deleted your data analysis. Yeah. Okay.
Now we're working, now we're changing the conference to be data analysis. <laughs> Hopefully there's an undo button. By the way, Julie, by the way, just uh, uh, I have trouble. I can't really write things because my computer is being used to read their pad. So if anyone else could write notes because. Uh, well, I was writing notes and now I'm up here. Writing the notes so now she's talking, please do. She will be writing the notes on her own talk. So Peter Pad's right there. And you can fix maybe the, the cut and paste that you did. <laughs> yeah. Is there an undo? Um, okay, so I'm on the hook to talk about uh, some data analysis I've done on Jitter. So I guess I should give you some background. About a year ago, um, I had an issue that I was running into at our company that many uh, practitioners uh, use of uh, preempt RT and, and in general empirical real time um, have an issue where it's like how much testing do I have to do before I, I can uh, say with some degree of satisfaction or certainty that we, ob we only observe worst case execution la latencies above um, a certain value. Um, and so you could run a test, you can like give it all the loads, give it pathological load scenarios, run a cyclic test for like, you know, days. But is that, is that good enough? You'll get a result out of that. You'll get a, ma a maximum uh, latency. Is that, gonna be, is that gonna be good enough? Um, so what I set out to do is to explore in the statistical area, are there tools out there that could be used um, such that I could make stronger guarantees um, using some, some, uh, some formal statistical methods? Um, so how many of you were in Daniel Bristot's talk? Okay, well, I imagine a lot of you. Uh, so he, he uh, mentioned a, a form of analysis called extreme value analysis. So extreme value analysis, um, in a nutshell, is if it is an analysis whereby if you are taking a, a collection of samples from a distribution of unknown shape and size, and those samples are independent uh, from one another and identically distributed, and you take a collection of those in samples, and then you look at the extrema, um, and you capture that, and you do that over and over again. You collect in samples, and you look at the, the extrema value. So in this case, you would look at like, the worst case execution latency. Um, so commonly in cyclic tests, this would be like, I run cyclic tests for an hour, it collects a lot of samples, and then I look at the worst case execution latency. So what an extreme value analysis allows you to do is actually describe the uh, distribution of those extremas. Uh, and there's a, there's a central uh, notion in statistics that like says that regardless of the original, uh, the originating distribution uh, that you are sampling from, there are three well-defined distributions of the extremas collected by a collection of samples from that. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a compelling, so I, I read about this and I was like, this is like super compelling. This is kind of what I want. Um, and uh, so I wanted to show you a little bit about where this kind of analysis has been used. Um, so one, one way that uh, this is actually used is for city planning, um, in particular like uh, describing infrastructure for flooding. So, um, you know, we have all this historical record about how often it rains and what the peak flow of rain is. Um, and so you can take all that data that you've collected over the many years, uh, you can fit it to a, one of these three classes of distributions uh, according to extreme value analysis. Um, and then, so that's kind of what this shows here. So this is called a return level plot. Um, so how many of you ever heard of like a 100 year flood? Uh, it kind of comes from, from this notion, right? You can fit to this distribution uh, and you can actually look out in the future and see, okay, how often would I expect to see a flood of this magnitude? Um, and so this is some example data I pulled. So the y-axis the y is like a peak a peak uh, observed uh, flow rate of water, maybe in a channel or something. And on the x-axis, you have a number of years. You can see like, okay, after at about 100 years, the point estimate would show that you would expect to see over a course of 100 years, you should see a, th a max of 350, uh, I think it's like cubic meters per second or something. Um, so this looked really compelling to me for a variety of reasons. One of which is I would like to see a similar plot when it comes to like worst case execution latency for, latency okay. for preempt RT. And secondly, there is a confidence interval uh, in this built into the model. The, the, the model fitting gives yeah. you an estimation of the, the parameters of this fifth distribution. And, and so I, I wanna be able to confidently say maybe it looks like a 95% confidence interval that in 100 years, 
uh, you, you will see anywhere between 250 to uh, you know 450 uh, cubic meters per second. Um, I'm so just curious yeah. how the how the dots could actually be lower later the longer it is, because if you think it, it would like 200 years is lower than the 100 years, then you would think that hey. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know that I'm prepared to answer that, but I, I, I yeah I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I looked at this and I said, wow, this is, this is like a really compelling thing. Um, and you know, it would be really nice if I could tell our customers who are, are largely control, control system people that like to go crazy in their control engineering side, um, that I could like give them a, here's the, the distribution that we fit and here's what you can expect. And so therefore you can design your control algorithm uh, accordingly. Um, so here's, here's what I did. So I have, I have a, a, a test rack and I collected like, I think I collected like 75 hours worth of data. Um, and then for each of those hours, I collected the, the observed uh, worst case execution latency on a specific CPU um, and I fit it. And you know, I said, you know what? I'm not a statistician. That looks, r that looks good, right? And, and I continued along. And uh, so I, I was able to actually construct a very compelling uh, story. So down here is the, uh, the x-axis is the, um, it's a multiple of the period. In this case, it's an hour. So you can see like at one hour, I can say given the number of samples that I've collected, I could see, I would expect to see um, latencies around uh, 70 microseconds within a given range. Now my intuition tells me that I should be able to do more testing and actually further constrain uh, the, that range in that prediction. Um, and so therefore, I could conceivably have some marketing person come to me and say like, here's the guarantee I want to make. And I can say, okay, here's how much it's gonna cost in terms of the testing, the number of testing hours, right? Eh, I can dream. Uh, <laughs> so this is like, I, I really like this and I, and, I, and I dove in and I talked to Daniel because he's an academic kind of. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he pointed me in there. Daniel or other Daniel? <laughs> Which Daniel? He has a foot in, the, in, in, in both worlds, so that, oh, was, that, that was, he was Daniel. a helpful, <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, Daniel Verstad. <laughs> sorry, I should always clarify. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, I could say Daniel 1 and 2, but that implies an order that I'm not uh, happy uh, defining. Um, uh, so so uh, one, of the, one of the challenges in this, uh, in this is that it doesn't actually work. Um, so I'm, I'm up here kind of presenting kind of a no result. Okay, and <laughs> yeah, so thank you, you're welcome. Um, actually, I'm, I'm here because I wanted to share this because this is actually really uh, interesting to me is that it doesn't work because the assumptions that are necessarily put in place for, to, for uh, extreme value analysis to proceed uh, successfully and actually be useful um, is that you need to be able to uh, collect samples that are independent from one another and identically distributed which actually, if you look at like a latency plot as a time series, like there's clearly autocorrelations. Um, these samples, there is not, it's not an independent uh, distribution. So it, in fact, you can do, and I, I started going down this path and, and, and kind of uh, ended because I was kind of saddened, but you, there's a series of independence tests that you can actually perform on the, on the samples you collect and you can clearly see that like we're not independent of one another. So I, I feel like there was like this academic world, like someone in academia was reaching their hand down to me and saying, oh, this is gonna be really good for you, and I just fell short, because, you know, the real world and stuff. So, yeah. anyway, I wanted to share this, because I thought you might find this interesting. And if anyone has any questions or further analysis that we can, that might be of interest, um, I'd love to hear it. I think this is gonna segue pretty well into what Daniel's gonna talk about. Daniel Bristoff, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, a question, I mean, does this sound like it's useful information to have, yes? Okay, um, I, I don't know, perhaps it's unwarranted optimism, but I think ch chucking out the entire approach just because of the independence of distributions, it, it, it probably doesn't work for preempt RT because of the level of hard guarantees that you have to give. Yeah. But the lack of independence is something that has always been there. For example, when looking at things yeah. like IO latency, um, it's often bi or trimodal, that is the distribution, and it's still interesting to know what the frequency of those are. So, uh, and. Uh, I think this would have a, a applications in other areas where being absolutely correct is not necessarily your yeah. target. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I've seen plenty of cases over the course of the last couple of years where uh, in the, trying to deal with extreme values, 
yeah, I'm trying to figure out how often they occur. Do they occur every like five minutes, every five hours, every mm -hmm. 15 hours? I think if I'd known something like this, my life would have been a lot easier because it turned into throw a couple of darts at the wall and hope. Yeah. So uh, thanks mm -hmm. for this. Yeah. I, I, I actually went down the route of like trying to figure out how I could um, correct, like, I could look at doing time series analysis and kind of do some filter filtering of the latency values that are coming out of the time series analysis to try to eliminate some of the effects of, of like dependence. For example, like if you have a latency spike, the next sample you take is likely to be uh, another high latency spike, maybe not at the same same capacity, and just kind of like break down from a time series perspective, um, but kind of haven't come with any um, conclusions in that way. So yeah, well, can this uh, data analysis then show? Um, Maybe causes. Let me say, if there's a maybe you don't know what the relationship is. Do this type of data analysis, and then be able to say, oh wait, oh when this happens, like be able to see how like patterns and say, and then try to figure out why there might be a spike. Yeah, I guess I guess you're asking whether or not like we could clearly show some kind of outlier. Um, yeah, whether yeah. or not we could like li in a live manner say say whether or not you're you're witnessing some out outlier. Like yeah. in, in like a live running and, system and or something. And knowing what the cause of that outlier was. That yeah. Would, that would be really nice. I mean, yeah. sure. I, I don't, it's not obvious to me how we would do that, but I suppose it's possible. I guess I would suggest that I would like to see that you continue it because of just the fact that it is a trending, I mean, it, it, it shows trends as opposed to, you know, yeah. hard and fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm going to lean on some academic people if right. I can get, if I can find them. Ooh, not in this room, probably. That. <laughs> just that's right. Just one addition, we try to um, to use extreme value analysis in the latency for Linux, but the problem is that the extreme value analysis, it's nice to measure worst case execution time when we have one application and this application has one control path. The problem is that when we have a latency, we don't have one control path, but the, the latency is the result of a many paths that we take from the wake up until the starting of the task. So now we have the latency because the system was idle, then we get the latency because we run the code of our regular preemption or because we take a, a section with a very long uh, preemption disabled. So we are analyzing very different code paths and we are having some uh, outputs that are, they are different, they are not related to each other and and like we have like, uh, in the start we have a, a distribution very close where we have a many occurrence of that latency, but then we have a very far tail. Mm -hmm. And this very far tail is the problem when we are trying to measure. So one good way would be to, se to separate each execution, each latency, mm -hmm. and compare that latency with the other occurrence of that latency. Yeah. And then, or we get the worst latency mm -hmm. and try to measure all, all the times that we get that path and use uh, extreme value analysis on that path. Yeah. So yeah, the, the point is that uh, it's, this is more complex yeah. and we need to, we, we will need to break down the latency into different metrics and apply this. Yeah, I hear yeah. someone is working on uh, some tooling that would help do that. I, I know a guy is working to break in these metrics. Oh, okay. And he's helping guys with extreme value, but uh, he doesn't know about extreme value too much. He knows the requirements, but doesn't know the, 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 the probabilistic and the statistic part yeah. because he, he's already tired. Well, I'm up here pretending that I do, but yeah. I don't, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's all I had. Is that, uh, yeah, he's like, he's like, wait, it's me? <laughs> Break is after you. It's after you. It's at uh, 3.30. See, it's so go fast. <laughs> yeah, just remember, yeah, everyone's waiting for you to go out for the break. <laughs> Give your presentation to Stephen. He goes <laughs> Is it that a, that a 
Okay. Uh, the You're not going very fast, are you? <coughs> that, that's intentional. Yeah, he was, I was his mentor. Oh, nice. It's my nephew. <laughs> Sorry? Let's show my family. That's it. So. Yeah, I didn't change the first one. So here I am again with that story about the logical sequence and logical correctness and timing correctness. So back with that theory, like in the theory, real-time systems, we analyze the system as a set of variables, of independent variables, and we do use these variables, for example, the, the period of the task, the execution time of the task, and the deadline of task, which are abstractions that we are now using on SCAD deadline, and they are already present on kernel, right? But there are some other variables that are used there, like the blocking time of a task, how long does the task block on uh, lock, the, on the idea of lock. And then they use these, these variables to say that if the system is schedulable or not. And then they do that math saying that, okay, knowing that my worst case execution time is EC, my blocking time is B, and the interference of other tasks with a higher priority is this, my response time is that. And so for all the tasks of the system, I compute the response time and then I can say, okay, if uh, all the tasks complete before the deadline, the system is schedulable. And that's how they do analysis. So, okay, this is a little bit complicated to see the things, but we can draw the picture. And uh, I forgot to, does anyone have a laser? I thought it was after the break. I have it. It's time in the future. That's a real time, real time presentation. And I and I am now getting this Steven style, like it left me things to the last minute. <laughs> yeah, that's no, that's a blocking time. I was waiting for a resource. <laughs> I was already running. <laughs> so we have the in in sorry? Yeah, and you as well. <laughs> no, so we have, uh, in the academic side, we say that we can have a release jitter, which is the time between the activation and the starting of the time, the starting of the execution. We have uh, the task execution itself, which is the execution time, or worst case execution time. We have a blocking time of tasks, and we have interference from with cloud and from, no, I mean, from other tasks. And what really matters for them, they use all these abstractions to, in the end, know if the response time it's before the deadline, like a deadline equals to period, for example. And they care about this variable, the response time. That's what really matter. The other metrics are used to compose the response time. So, on the parameter T, we measure our timing correctness using the latency. And the latency is good. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say it's bad. It, it brings, uh, okay, we are all here because we have uh, the parameter T and it, the latency is the main motor of the innovation there, for example, to keep things work, so it's good. But we can go further, we can go beyond that. So now let's criticize, but criticize in a good way to try to find a better solution, right? Uh, sorry? <laughs> no, I'm generally kind. Uh, okay, the, the idea of latency, we all know what is the latency, but it's actually composed of many other things that happen on kernel. It's RQs, local RQs disable, preemption disable, and uh, a higher priority task that we are not analyzing like a stop machine. So we actually end up seeing the kernel as a black box. 
and we measure it using cyclic test. Then, but as we use uh, the kernel as a black box, we have no guarantee that, okay, I hit the latest now and we will continue the bugging and now I will enable trace. I have no guarantee that that situation will take place again. And if something happens and it's similar, we have no guarantee that we are reproducing the same problem. And then sometimes we we'll end up uh, having latencies that happen once a week and, and it's hard to find it out again. Because the chain, it doesn't mean also that the chain of events didn't take place. They might be taking place. We are just not catching them in the correct order to cause the latency. So, moreover, I it's very hard, if not impossible, to give a guarantee on the worst case latency. And that's the case that Julia was talking about. Like, the, the variance in the latency is so, like, unconnected one data with other that the uh, probabilistic methods to define worst case, for example, worst case action time, they doesn't fit in the latency. We tried, no, not I, I, I helped with the measurements with a friend that works with probabilistic. She's a specialist on the probabilistic part. And she just said, okay, the, var the, the way that the data is, the tail is so long that we cannot make any relation with the rest of the data. So he, we, we found that we could not use extreme value analysis, for example, which is a hot topic on this matter, on the latency. But uh, other than the latency, we have other things that one real-time task may depend on, like, and we have solutions for it. For example, we have tasks depending on lock, and we have a priority inheritance for lock. But we generally, uh, how, how, many, how many times do we see people complaining of one version or the other that this lock is starting to, to take more time to be held? Um, we, we don't do analysis on the locking time of the locks that we have on kernel. And uh, moreover, tasks depends on other tasks. For example, the latency itself depends on an IRQ. And the IRQ, if we see it as a thread, it's a task, sorry. It has some, uh, the, some causes of the delay for the interrupts, and then the thread, again, there is another set of causes. So we have dependence among tasks that we usually don't analyze, and uh, interference, like uh, interference of tasks on another tasks, and interference of IRQs on tasks. We don't know, uh, for example, if the execution time of a interrupt handler, a threaded interrupt handler in the real-time kernel, it uh, increases because the driver changed. We don't measure this. So it's hard to say, to catch such kind of uh, change that might change the schedulability of my system in practice. If I have a, uh, a change on the way, on the timing that I, that I hel held a lock, it will influence on the response time. If I have a, a driver, even a threaded driver that is taking more, that's taking longer to execute, it's also influencing the execution time of the threads with lower priority. But we don't do this kind of a check or these measurements in the day by day testing with parameter T. Do I? Do we? So. We have the latency, it's good, but we also have other problems to care that we are actually not uh, doing uh, extensive uh, uh, testing and, and trying to figure out if things get worse or better over the time. So this is the topic of discussion, this is the problem. So how can we improve the situation of testing on the parameter T to catch the variation of these blocking time, execution time of other things that are part of the system, like IRQ handlers. And um, okay, in the end, uh, we had a discussion last week talking about uh, throttling and even uh, some uh, ideas of what is a task on Linux. Should we consider IRQs, or, uh, IRQs as a sort of task on Linux? And um, what are the other possible metrics that we can use? 
how can we measure the execution time of tasks? That's, that's a barrier to using the SCAD deadline, for example, because we need to inform the execution time of tasks. How do we measure it? And how measuring it, how do we isolate it from the other things that are not part of the tasks, like IRQs, blocking time, scheduling overhead? How, how, how do we catch only uh, the execution time of the tasks? Well, Dan Daniel, that's why just one thing about the uh, execution time of tasks is extremely difficult because you also have hardware that you never write, get the same. You right. know, one thing could run very, very quickly depending on how it's got the cache, or how's it, and there's so many variables with that in the hardware, let alone the operating system. Yeah, yeah. It's no. really almost impossible to find out the execution time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But we need to know the execution time, for example, to use CAD deadline. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. And then, then we are more or less locked up. I'm not saying that we have a, a solution. I say that these are things that we need to think. Go, go to. Heads up. It depends also on the domain. I mean, for I don't know, kind of soft real time type of workloads, you're probably probabilistic analysis of execution time are probably okay. If you have, uh, of course, an real time type of system, the system be the thing is different. So depends also on what you're planning to apply your analysis, analysis on. Yeah. Actually, I find out it's more of a percentage, percentage of CPU is probably a better chance of what you get than actual execution time. It's saying, I just want this guy to make sure it's guaranteed a percentage of the CPU than you know, a portion of it. But so really trying to say how much execution time per period is kind of a lost cause. No, but we, uh, no, even in your workload, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't see this as a lost cause. I think no. we have been using the, for example, the extreme value analysis to measure the execution time of tasks. And, uh, sorry? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have the, okay. We use extreme value analysis to measure the execution time of tasks on Linux, and it worked fine. As long as we remove the things like interference of other tasks, interference of fire queues, and we were able to fit it in the model of extreme value analysis. So it might be less difficult than we think. But we need to start to looking at these values and start to catch some values and, and measure the, these over the time. If they, is, they dramatically change from one version to another and to look at, okay, what caused this change? I was seeing this blocking time in maximum on the RQ lock. And then on this next version, we catch this uh, higher value on the RQ log. What changed? Yeah, uh, my question is, some of these things are easier or some of the components are easier to, to measure. But even those, uh, can you ignore the, uh, the cost of measuring them? Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's another point then. And this is about how, can, how would we measure these values? What method we will use to reduce the interference of the tracing? Um, well, I, I am more raising questions than giving solutions here. That's the idea. Um, what are the other metrics we need to use? What are the other, what are the tools that we need to use them? Should we continue using tools in the user space looking kernel as a, a black box? Or should we move these measurements for the kernel using trace, like a trace plugin on F trace? I mean, and one thing I've learned from trying to trace things to try to have at least amount of overhead is you could measure one thing at a time. If you try to measure more than one thing, the other measurements will then interfere with the measure other measurements. And um, I've actually seen people like use function graph tracer and look at the result of you know how long every function executed. And I said, well, you know, when you look at this function, it called 20 different functions. The function graph tracer itself just slowed it down tremendously. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I always say, measure what one, what's one function is, measure one function, because yeah. then it's off by a few nanoseconds, and it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, so, so in, in this case, it would translate for something like, okay, we will now do regression tests, for example, just for locks, and using this tool. And then we'll separate it, okay, just measure the execution times of uh, IRQs and just measure it separated. And, and one thing that would be interesting to do is maybe we should, well, one thing I am rewriting Function Graph Tracer now to hopefully make it a little bit like lighter weight and other things, but to be able to, instead of doing the recording into the ring buffer, because we may not care about 
you know, everything, all that. We just want a metric, a higher, uh, histogram. So maybe, uh, maybe attaching histogram to the functional graph tracer just to give me the numbers that will drop the overhead. So all these things, you might just, you just care about numbers. You don't care about the actual paths. So right. you don't yeah. want tracing. Yeah. You want just like profile to get, or get record. values. Correct, yes. correct. Yeah. So, so we should change the infrastructure to do that. So for example, no, now this, let's try to apply this to one thing that we have something more or less started. He's my manager. He's the highest priority. <laughs> <laughs> you get a raise. Um, so like for blocking time, are we, we're, that's mainly lock hold time? Yeah, for example, we have a lock uh, sketch stats. That's what I was wondering is, aren't, don't we have that, don't, aren't most of our mutual exclusion primitives instrumented in some way so we could say this one was held for, you know, X lockstep. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, that at least uh, we might yeah, be able to go in and lockstep, not get stuff. You know, calculate for a particular task a uh, I wouldn't call it a hard value, but an average blocking. Yeah, time. but for example, yeah, it's a sketch stat. Uh, it's wrong here, so it's a uh, lockstep. But lockstep only works with uh, lock depth on. Right. Yeah, yeah and yeah, that's I, I, I tried to unconnect one from the other, but I didn't have time. So should we, wha what would be the better approach for someone trying to implement this? Should do something like, uh, yeah, but trace lock also depends on lock depth. Yeah, those trace points are enabled only with lock depth. With function, yeah, one, one can use function graph as well. So we have a lot of tools and ways to do this. What would be the best way for one guy that will try to do this? Should try to do in a in a way more no. Oh yeah, <laughs> Clark has one. And, uh, oh very very nice. I like that. We are Where's Paul? So asking well, Paul McKinney is asking IBM as far as I'm concerned. So. Yeah, we. So should we use like uh, something using tracing? trace plugin? Should we use trace points and export the data to user space and process on perf? Should we use a sketch uh, uh, log stat like analysis, grabbing the data and the numbers and storing as functions on kernel? What, what, what would be the point? Because just... I mean, I could see us... Yeah, go back to that other one which shows the components. For blocking time, we have a, we have a starting point. Yeah. Right? But I'm lost on interference. I mean, is that is because you're talking about interrupts occurring and preemptions? Okay. Know, in, in the theory, interference is any kind of highest priority task that preempts the current execution. So, so, so what are we asking there is we've got to put something in this task structure that says that tracks how many times I've been preempted? Yeah. I mean, how and how long, right. How long? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, why don't you just have like the uh, the sked trace point, and you have Thompson Nussi's, um histogram code, and you can do histograms and actually show you like what and do it off of like who is preempting me. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that, already that, there. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point. We have many kinds of ways to do the same thing, but. What would be the what would be the the best method, sir? What uh, today the universe today the universal answer to all these questions is BPF, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoop. That's that's similar to forty two. <laughs> Do you plan to use this measurement for something Sorry? that will totally change the value of the measurement? Uh, I'm sorry. Any actions you take as a result of measuring this, won't they totally change the value of the measurement? That was my question. That was my question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it, it, it depends on the order of this measurement. If it takes like a milliseconds and we are measuring on nanoseconds, it's, it's negligible. So I think one of the first things you might want to do is, so, so we know blocking, we know interference, but don't you have two others up there? Or at least one, the oh. jitter? I'm sorry? You've got jitter up there, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, this, this is the jitter. So enumerate the, uh, the things we're trying to find, just, just so that we all can see it without having to, like, you know, you've already confused me by throwing an equation up there, and I just kind of went, uh, Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, if, if you would just give us a list to say, okay, this jitter, and point to the diagram to say that's, that's the, you know, the interference startup. Interference over here while execution is running, blocking, trying to uh, obtain a lock. Um, that actually looks like it all, but then an explanation of it, and then how do we figure it out? Are, is the data already there? It looks like, I'm not sure for, for activation jitter, but it looks like for blocking and for interference, we might have some numbers to start with. It's just a matter of how do we collect it? I guess it's yeah. not just how we coll collect it, but what are we how doing we with it? Right. Well, yeah. How we collect it? We yeah, collect that's it. We collect the numbers, and now what? Yeah. yeah. So. We how how would we collect these I mean, numbers? How would we well, try? Well, we gave you a bunch of answers for that. I mean, I could tell you a bunch of things to do in tracing to get those numbers. I and to me, I'm working at trying to get the overhead down. I mean, you don't need. They said you don't need actual tracing. You just want the histograms. You don't, you just want the the numbers, and that actually drops off a lot of the overhead. <coughs> and we just make it a minimum. I mean, function graph tracer should be able to. You do that, and you get the entry and exit of a function, and you trace. Like I said, the lock function, the mutex functions, the spin lock functions, if you just put them to be traced, you get the entry and exit. And that way you actually, I, that's one thing I use is see, okay, where, how long have these things been held? Like why am I blocked for so long? And then you use the sked trace points to do, like I said, the pseudo events to get the, uh, that just doesn't, rec all it does is it does the histograms. It doesn't do any recording of the events itself. You just get a nice histogram of, so and then looking at what preempted you. So your, your suggestion would be using the, doing the processing in the kernel, using the ftrace interface, not tracing, but getting the numbers and the storing there and putting the interface there? Yes. That's something I, uh, I also agree it's a good, uh, a good way to proceed, but is there any other way that people would suggest? You want people to suggest BPF, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. I actually, it's I, like, well, you're asking that. Anything else? Beep. No, no, but the problem is that I, I agree with you. <laughs> if I, okay, when I was doing this thing, now what I would do, okay, connecting with the, the, le the previous presentation. Here I will collect a very fine grained events. What, 10 seconds of a tracing collects me one gig of data. So I was picking all these traces with trace points, and then grabbing them in user space and processing with perf. It works fine, but I need to allocate all my memory to do tracing. So I was planning to bring things, it, it worked fine to validate the model, but now that I want to extract a, ma a matrix, like a copying data to user space, it's, it's costly, and I cannot do longer analysis. I, I need to do like every 30 seconds, stop doing analysis every 30 seconds trace, analyze again. So my you idea is to continue. You, you don't want all of that data, right? All you want is just the No, that, okay, now that's what, that's what I'm doing now to validate the model. Now what I, I was thinking is that, okay, I don't need to collect all the trace. I just need, uh, after setting the metrics, I will need to catch information on these trace points, but I don't need the trace points. Don't need the trace data. The trace data. I, I need the hooks on that that points, mm -hmm. but I don't need to the trace information. I just need to process that information on the, on the matrix. Is the method the, that Steven mentioned the way that I should go? Um, so for, for validation of the model, the easiest would be to um, build it in a kernel module and, and register to the trace points and then run it live. Yeah. So I, I think I, I'll repeat, I think you said, so I make sure I get it right. You said just write a kernel module that hooks into the trace points that you want or the function graph tracer and just uh, put a hook in there and get the bare minimum tracing so that could drop the overhead. And like I said, it's, I would suggest that if the normal tooling proves to be o too much of overhead. Okay. And maybe you could do that just to try it and see if it does, yeah. if there's a difference. No. I mean, this is already output of tools, so I have to generate code and stick it in a module. Yeah, actually when you do a module, you can do even correlation on it per task level. Okay. And then store that data 
and yeah. get that separately out so you're not limited on on the restrictions or uh, uh, thingies which is which are uh, in f trace or proof of whatever so you can just yeah. do more flexible analysis but you can reuse all the existing trace points for that okay just yeah. by hooking into it and you have most of the information you need is already there yeah so good so we w the idea was the consensus that we need to hook on these places and then we can either or store this data on per cpu or per task uh, information or to you or to write a plugin on ftrace to use it or load a module Still gonna have to ship yeah, but the qu uh, one question now. I'm using trace points here that are not present on kernel. And but we might not uh, edit it. We someone might not want to edit it more trace points on the schedule. Have, so have you have you looked at the okay bef before uh, and you then get slammed? So uh, no, so so uh, okay, I I don't like trace events thingies, but I I don't mind just adding the raw hooks okay okay that's so basically to me that's perfect is we can't add the trace okay so the raw oh, hooks okay, we, the we used to be able to no no we still well no uh, sort of okay the terminology is trace points are actually the hooks trace events is the what you see in the in the okay. thing so you exactly. don't like trace events you like trace hooks and right now right the only way to add a trace point i try to avoid it but if we do add the trace hook what happens if the only thing that the, the trace event gives you is a value of a pointer that doesn't even give you the actual, it's an encrypted pointer. So it's basically a useless trace event that no one can build off of, but anyone can hook to. But <laughs> the reason why, okay, the reason why I say that yeah, is because I really don't want to open up the can of worms of people injecting trace, event, uh, trace points all over the place too, because right now, though, I mean, Because we used to be able to do that. that that's yeah. how much I started all that. Uh, it's, uh, we, it, it started, it started with with yeah, with we did that. Well, I don't think it actually ever made it to a version. I think we did that in a in a release cycle, and it actually changed before it actually was released. Possibly, but yeah. Um. I mean, the original code was added to make the trace events. The trace points were added to these events because we were afraid well, of. Well, much of first the, the trace right. hooks, and then you did the events on top but of it, and yeah, now so we can only do events. Yeah. So we could make just like I, s I once mentioned a trace marker, but just have a way of just saying here's a trace point. But like I said, right now we get away by just saying a trace event with just the pointer values. And really you can't build any user space tools on top of that. Because all you're getting is a pointer value and it's kind of useless. And it's encrypted by today's randomness, so. So, so, but so I, I ideally, we, so ideally we're not even exposed to the user space at all. Right. Like they're, not, right. they're not visible in this event. Exactly, and well, no, well, ideally you want that. You might get it still there. You'll still see them there. And that, well, it might be useful because then you'd be able to hook BPF to it. <laughs> and <laughs> can can we can we put hooks in the SCAD deadline? Yeah, I think that's what just just to hooks. Okay. Yeah, that's I mean for for SCAD deadline we need one or two more hooks because uh, most of the the existing ones are sufficient if you use them as hooks. They're not sufficient if you use them as events um, because the the actual event code mm -hmm. uh, doesn't know about well that. Actually, line. I'm, I'm but they're in the right location. They have the information available. But yeah, I mean, actually, if it's there, you could put PPF. You could get everything you want in BPF to if the hook is there or with the or event or a custom event. module, or, or a custom module. Anything that yes, can consume custom, anything to do it, custom module or BPF, so they both will be able to have access to it. But it won't be that normal. It won't have information there that's you know you get from the trace point itself that you don't like with the SCAD events. So am I free to suggest hooks? Hooks is okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. <sighs> One thing that uh, Daniel said that uh, caught my attention is uh, to characterize the, the latency. So to uh, the, the order of the events, the order of the components of the latency. Uh, we already have uh, ways to, to measure the latency. Maybe it would be nice to also have uh, these, this order. Oh, so it happened on IRQ, uh, IRQ, it was blocked, and then I got this latency. Well, then you need a full trace. Yeah, but, that, but with the hooks, that's easy. 
Yeah, and uh, I just need the order. I don't need uh, oh, the just, just saying, okay, so basically almost like a stack trace type of thing, yeah. just recording. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, uh, with, with the hooks, we can put dynamic yeah. trace. And, and we can put dynamic trace events. Like with yes. the hooks, the it's events. easy to edit the... The right? pseudo event. The, 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 the synthetic events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you actually can actually make synthetic events built on top of them. Yeah. And the hooks simplify everything. Like having the hook, we can use other techniques, and then oh. we can okay. even develop a trace to measure this. And now we're just doing a uh, scheduling switch. Okay. For break time. Oof. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>so yeah but basically this is a continuation of the this morning uh, uh presentation about basically what's coming next uh, in sked deadline we just thought that uh, since there are a lot of points uh up for discussion and interesting to implement i guess the purpose with this is to just pick a few uh one two i don't know three items that we think are worth uh, implementing looking at like in the near future I kind of already made my choice, but then uh, it's up for discussion if I should continue doing that or maybe move to something else, and that's really uh, happens for Danny. And if anyone actually wants to uh, work on something after this, it's more than welcome because <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done, so. Uh, I, well, that's uh, up for discussion. I can either, basically I have uh, the list of points that I discussed, uh, discussed uh, this morning, but I have also, uh, there are basically the same slides, Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, can definitely do that. But first of all, that is this slide, right? Uh, are you actually putting this on your slides? <laughs> yeah, because basically when uh, this guy uh, told us on IRC that uh, he's using scheduling on uh, products, then we kind of agree that, I mean, my, my thing was actually I'm going to put these slides on every presentation I'm doing about scheduling because that was kind of good thing for me. <laughs> because <laughs> so anyway. And when, and when that happened, Clark came to me on RC. Oh, did you see? Did you see? They are using scheduling. deadline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, I was wondering this for a long time. So okay, that's a good sign. Anyway, uh, that's basically what I presented this morning. Apart from uh, this first. Uh, point that I didn't touch this morning that's up for discussion actually currently on the on the mailing list uh, uh, I don't have slides for the first point. I'm just uh, basically this is a point uh, uh, a Problem pointed out by a, an RCU uh, Split that happened like a month ago on the kernel and we basically I started discussing this thing and actually trying to understand what was going on and in the, the particular case the reproducer was uh, a uh, simple deadline task, uh, which was using perf on itself, so gen uh, basically auto-generating RQ uh, load on itself. Uh, the point with the problem with that, well, the problem, how the deadline works today is that we do runtime enforcement using RQ clock task, which on uh, system configure uh, with RQ accounting, uh, basically, you have a skew between the uh, clock that we're using to perform runtime enforcement and the clock we're using to actually reset the deadline. So it is possible for basically a task that actually has uh, a high RQ load to basically be outside the runtime enforcement. In that particular case, that task will uh, would actually do a kind of while one uh, loop and was uh, causing starvation to the others. So that's something we had to discuss and fix it. There are, well, we already discussed the thing on the mini disk quite, quite a lot. Uh, but let me first, I guess, uh, go to the other points quickly so that everybody is on the same page. non root usage. So today, uh, SCAD deadlines uh, usage is reserved only for root users. Uh, this guy was wondering why, and I uh, was uh, kind of trying to use SCAD deadline for a user space audio application. So you wonder why I'm not uh, supposed to be uh, able to use that from user space. And uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, reasons why we don't allow that uh, yet. One is uh, because we don't have the same priority inheritance mechanism implemented right now, which is dangerous, potentially dangerous for not root usage. And we don't have uh, uh, a same uh, interface to manage uh, 
potentially manage bandwidth for not root uh, users. Uh, the first point, the priority inheritance point, uh, might be cured uh, with the what basically called uh, proxy execution. So basically, I started working on uh, Peter's patches and I posted the first version of this thing. What it is about, um, I guess everybody is familiar with the uh, priority inversion and uh, how uh, priority inheritance fixes the problem. Uh, currently, we inherit only the deadline of the blocked task for deadline. Uh, that has uh, a problem uh, that we are actually um, basically relaxing the, I mean, removing the runtime enforcement for the tasks that are boosted. So, for example, in this case, the low priority guy here inherits the deadline of this guy and is actually outside the runtime enforcement. So, he can actually jeopardize whatever else is on the system. So, that's really bad for, especially for not root users. Uh, with proxy execution, so the idea would be to use the scheduling information of the uh, donor, so whoever blocks on the mutex, to actually use this information on the on the owner. And uh, inside, for example, the scheduling entity, you have uh, a runtime and period the deadline of the donor, so you can actually use that and uh, uh, without the need for disabling uh, runtime enforcement. Uh, that's one of the things, that, that's basically uh, has been kind of my call on what seems higher priority to work on. Because uh, if we manage to implement and fix this problem, then uh, uh, one of the biggest two points that uh, we want to solve to be able to give uh, no root access to SCAD deadline is, uh, is going to be fixed. So that's what basically I'm working on. And the other point is about, uh, yeah, this is the proxy execution. They might be actually more general than just the uh, deadline stuff, but that's, yeah. The other point is uh, C-group support. So currently we don't have at all C-group support, it's just the SCAD set rat uh, syscall that the user can ask uh, to associate a runtime and a period to a single thread. Uh, it might be handy to have uh, C-group support. Uh, there are two ways, um, or two, let's say, uh, levels uh, of uh, implementing this. One could be, and I actually already proposed an RFC of this, um, to just extend the interface we already have uh, on the CPU controller for uh, SCAD5, also fixed priority uh, RT, to also uh, basically um, manage the bandwidth we can assign to, to deadline. So extending basically the interface with these two parameters and uh, in that way the system owner, so whoever has root access can distribute the available bandwidth among uh, normal users. That might be one thing, first thing we want to, to have. And the second one, which is more tricky to, to implement and uh, to handle in general because there are like points uh, that are not clear yet uh, how to be uh, in handled and implemented is uh, complete, I mean, full hierarchical scheduling where you have uh, a two-level two scheduler. At the root level, you, have, uh, you can have a single entities like uh, these three and an entity uh, which is actually a group which is the same thing as uh, CFS and uh, RT they are doing. So at the first level you select uh, considering the, the deadline of those uh, and then inside here you rerun basically the scheduler that picks the five or tasks that are inside here. It will be kind of, uh, might be helpful in situation where you have uh, let's say a set of tasks that uh, they share a common let's say goal. In this case uh, I made it a sec an example of uh, a pipeline of tasks. If you don't have uh, C-group support, I mean the hierarchical C-group support, and that's the situation of today, you have to go there and specify deadline runtime for each one of those, which might be tricky because uh, you don't really probably know how they, they fit together. If you have the hierarchical uh, mechanism implemented, uh, uh, you are left with just two parameters. You have the deadline and period for the whole uh, pipeline and the runtime for the whole thing. So it might be simpler to get it right, I guess. Uh, but then, 
would you also have to do the analysis within the group and set it for... Yes, there is uh, RT analysis you can perform uh, to say that uh, whatever you put inside here has some guarantees, uh, theoretical guarantees. So there is some analysis, but uh, fortunately the, the theory should be already covered as far as I know. So yeah, we just need to implement this thing. Um, yeah, the, for example, one of the problems that uh, although this idea has is uh, at least uh, how it's implemented right now, there was uh, an RFC kind of a year ago uh, posted and that's the, let's say, reference implementation. Of course, we can change that. Is uh, the way we implement is uh, once we have the runtime, uh, so the bandwidth associated with the group, that bandwidth in this case is uh, this uh, red, uh, big red block here is actually replicated on each CPU. And uh, you might have, uh, for example, a case where one of the CPU is actually not consuming the, the bandwidth, and there might be uh, basically a waste of, uh, of bandwidth in this case. Uh, one way to fix that, we will, as I mentioned this morning, might be to reclaim the unused bandwidth, and that's already something that we have uh, in the kernel. I think Peter. So I don't think Rob. Yeah. So I don't think Rob will actually work for that. Um, suppose you have a machine with, say, 200 GPUs in, um, and you have one. Uh, one of these groups that requires, say, 70% of two CPUs, mm -hmm. then you make a C group and you lost 70% of all 200 of your CPUs. Yeah, I guess you refer to the fact that the admission control already uh, basically checks that. So and even though we might cope with the, the problem at runtime, that's already too late, right? So, so there the question is whether you want to have uh, as an extra parameter for the C group, because you know up front that you're going to need two or four CPUs in the worst case, that you limit it to that. Right, uh, I guess the, the problem there, I guess you also need to know the affinities of those tasks, or at least the CPU mask, uh, I mean the CPUs they might be running on. So you can restrict that, you can require it to be that yeah. to be known up front. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and if it's not known, just reject it. I mean, I think that's what, like, what Thomas is saying is the fact that what you need <coughs> is, I think, a partition. You need the C groups to partition it and say, you know, you can say, I know need these two CPUs to um, run. So you pick the CPUs you have it. So it may not have to be affinity. Maybe just like you have to, as part of the C groups, mm -hmm. to say that these two, uh, and then you can do whatever you want there. It doesn't affect the rest of the machine, so partition it nicely, and then you could do a lot of easily, a lot more ske easier scheduling. Right, actually, this Andy? fits also well with uh, what uh, Daniel, I guess, is gonna say in a bit. I'm uh, just wondering if, uh, since uh, I mean, I'm basically jumping uh, in the next thing, but next thing will be actually to replace, potentially replace the RT throttling mechanism using the deadline version of the same thing. So what I was wondering if, sorry, just finish. I uh, was wondering is if we actually impose this restriction, is actually a change of uh, paradigm uh, to what yeah. RT throttling is actually doing, right? So. Well, actually, one thing I was just talking to someone else earlier, and I said, you know, there's there's two things. You have deadline scheduling, which is I think very very strict as strict rules, but then there's also um, CPU bandwidth, which is not as strict, and you just basically don't worry about you just percentage wise, and then allow you know no guarantees now. If I would say have a CPU bandwidth that controls the RT tasks and everything else, I mean, why can't you like do it like then and build the actual more sh the stricter deadline scheduler on top oh, of so that? So you mean uh, moving the RT task you to use the, C the CPU basically bandwidth and then? Uh, yeah, there might be another thing. Because we don't really care if we miss. It's just basically we don't want to starve. The whole idea of the RT throttling is that you don't starve the system. Right. So you don't care about missing deadlines or not. You're just saying, I just want a percentage, uh, I just want a CPU but bandwidth. But, but I think that we are dealing with two problems. One is throttling, that is for this case, yes. and another is when we have a chain of, uh, I'd say, jobs that are done by different threads, but they are part of the same uh, task. 
for example, the audio pipeline. We have just one task, which is produce the audio pipeline, but it's composed of, of many threads. And then we use the hierarchical for this case. And, uh, but it's different yeah, of the throttling. Here. So, um, just a percentage of time doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but it, 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 I mean, I'm I, saying I, can, I can give you 50% uh, of my time. It doesn't mean, doesn't apply when. I mean, I can, I can no. spend some time with you in 100 years. Yeah, I know. And that would still be 50%. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. But I'm but saying, well, my question, my, the problem is with the, it's impossible to do a true, uh, uh, what's it called, a deadline scheduler among multiple CPU and a lot of different affinities and all that. But if you were to say, okay, but I don't care about guarantees. the semi-partitioning stuff gets very close to it. Yeah, uh, I, I guess, yeah, and 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 maybe and wait, and because uh, Daniel has uh, something that uh, relates to the problem of affinity, so maybe you can just uh, talk about this and then we continue. Okay, and, so and just to go by, I mean, will that solve the, the idea is like, can we put RT tasks, which could have any type of affinities we want, into that? I, so, so we need to look at it, but, but so uh, missing on that list, so the, the non-root usage needs proxy execution, but it also needs some other limits, but that's mostly sorted. Um, after that, I would very strongly suggest we look at the semi-partition stuff right, yeah. um, before doing any of the, of the other things on mm -hmm. top of it. So, uh, so you're saying uh, basically, well, this is the highest priority and that's uh, basically what I'm working on, the proxy execution thing right. it might take my it's while yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, <laughs> it's not trivial um, but then uh, uh, instead of implementing the hierarchical thing uh, moving to maybe what Daniel is, uh, is working on because it yeah, yeah. it's actually right. um, because that has the potential to solve a whole bunch of the problems that we've been facing yeah so I just I, I, I would okay these topics are related but they are okay just uh Explain something again. Same thing. Okay. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fourth presentation. The currently, Yuri was talking about hierarchical scheduling, in which inside what is a DL task now nowadays, we would be able to put more tasks inside and use that bandwidth mm -hmm. be scheduled using the deadline parameters. That's one thing. We have another thing that seems to be related, which is the real-time throttling. The real-time throttling is one way to safeguard uh, normal tasks, CFS tasks, from misbehaving real-time tasks. And so the idea is that <coughs> we assume some, on a period of uh, default values, uh, we can switch them. We, in a one second, we can left like, uh, 50 milliseconds for normal tasks to run. And so even if my FIFO task misbehaves, the run queue will be throttled and then my regular threads will be able to run. When we have multiple cores, we also have uh, another mechanism, which is the RT runtime share. So, so, so we disabled that for RT. And I think we no. should also. Do we? Uh, I'm pretty sure RT has that disabled. Oh, no, I, I suggested disabling it on that uh, patch with the RT runtime grid. I suggested also disabling, but it's not currently disabled. Okay, so. Well, uh, it, it's uh, easy, to, it's yeah. just switching the option. Uh, RT yeah, groups so are disabled. Yeah. But yeah. I, I thought we also killed this one. Because um, there's, um, it, it used to be disabled for a while. Um, and we should just kill the entire thing. Um, but for four minutes, no, a bit. Okay. Um, but but for the, the 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 throttling, we should basically do do explicit slack time scheduling. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm too, too many people talking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so I I would do simple per CPU slack time scheduling. Okay. So. Okay. Let's delete this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. This is broken. Yes. So, okay, okay, I will jump this part of throttling. 
because this seems to be a more uh, a more important problem to be resolved, which is the scalability improvements. <coughs> there are some user cases in which we cannot. Okay, the current scheduler accepts global scheduler or partition scheduler. Global, we have one scheduler for all CPUs. Partition, we have one scheduler for one CPU. And uh, there are some use cases in, it in which we cannot schedule uh, one task set that doesn't occupy all the CPU time using the SCAD global or partition. For example, here I have uh, six over nine and I still have uh, three units of time available here. And same time here, same thing here, like six over nine and I still have three times available here. So I have six times available, but I cannot fit this for that's this task that needs four units of time. And uh, so what do we have uh, in, the, um, in the academic side? It's a trending topic on this, is that we, rather than using just uh, global or partition, we use a same partition approach. And we have numbers that show that we can schedule way more using this semi-partition approach. Just a comparison, this is the global EDF, and these three here are partitioned uh, methods, like first fit, worst fit, best fit. And here is the same partition approach. We, on the same partition approach, we are always better than the others. Like we are 40, uh, 45, 44% better than global EDF. And uh, we are like uh, 30, to 20% better than uh, partition. So the same partition scheduler help, helps to improve the schedulability, but not only. But just to give one example, um, let's say that we have that task set that, we, that I presented before. In the uh, same partition, I would put these two tasks finite to each CPU. This will only run here, this will only run here. And then I would split that other CPU giving three other task. Given three units of time here, but with a constrained deadline, and the other one unit of time I would put here with <coughs> a very constrained deadline, which uh, I need one unit of time to run, and I have a constrained deadline of one, so it will run, start running. With this approach, we can schedule more tasks. This is one example of the schedulability that we can do more. Um, so, so why one, one, nine, and not one, that's one heuristic. This heuristic that uh, C equals to D is one that performs very, very good. Mm -hmm. Now this is one heuristic, we, one can change. We will even try to move this part to the beginning of the execution and do more tests. But yeah, this is one heuristic in the partitioning part. The admission control. So it changes how this deadline do the scheduling, but still use the SCAD deadline. We are not implementing another scheduler. And uh, okay. the heuristic is that to put a task on the processors. Um, okay, we use a, a heuristic to, to make it, to split the tasks. And we have a different kinds of reservations. We don't have one reservation per task. We have a multiple reservation for tasks. And uh, these reservations are assigned to CPUs. They are pinned. This reservation runs only on the CPU. Okay, yeah. just, uh, just real quick, um, <coughs> since we're actually out of time, I just want to get, how does this help? Don't, don't have to explain it anymore. I just want to say. Well, um, why is this good? Okay, yeah. the main point is there, affinities. We can do affinities. Yes, uh, okay, so can you do it generically? Yes. So that it, it might reduce the scalability so of so the system, but we can, we can ping so tasks. Here's the thing. So if you're using the RT tasks are going to be put into, the, you're going to replace this with the RT uh, throttling. How much overhead is that? I mean, if you every time you create an RT task, are you going to have to go through and do a new partitioning? I mean, how does that work? Okay. When we receive one task, we'll do the heuristics to split the tasks over the mm -hmm. CPUs. This has one cost, but it only takes place when we are setting the attributes of a, a task, which is an operation that we don't expect it to be fast. 
or when we change in the affinity, which is another operation that we don't expect it to well, be fast. It sounds like we have about forking tasks or something like that. I don't know how much RT tasks are created and destroyed. Is that an issue for, usually RT tasks are not created and destroyed quite a bit. Yes. So. Yeah, so okay, so RT tasks are not, uh, are that great, okay. so in, in fact, fork will fail. And unless you get some person that runs Hackbench under RT task. You can. <laughs> okay. You, you cannot, fork fails. Wait, oh, and fork fails? We may fork fail. So that means RT tasks can no longer fork? They cannot fork. Uh, yeah. Won't that break user space? I mean, that sounds like a break in. Uh, if you, if you there is. The, the default. There was no existing user space. Wait, no. It did not exist. It's a new scheduling class, so we could do whatever we wanted, and we well, decided wait, 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 no, no fork. No, no. I'm saying I thought we we're going to have uh, RT tasks. Be, uh, the RT throttling is going to be under this. Uh, but no, but then it'll be a FIFO. Right. And that's what I'm saying. The but so the FIFOs can can do, but the FIFOs right. will be constrained I mean, to uh, the inside the group. You can do whatever you want. Oh. You place the group. Oh, this is because we're doing two things, the hierarchy. It's not just yes. every task. And then per inside yeah, yeah. of the group, you have FIFO, and you can fork so as many FIFOs and, as and actually, you want. But then yeah. if you run out of, uh, out of uh, right. bandwidth, uh, okay, so this is basically just you, like, so we're not, you're we're throttled. So in other words, actually, this isn't even involved with the RT throttling then, because no. we don't care about affinities, because you just, it's going, it sounds like it's a global task that one group that, and then each task within the group could have its own affinities, correct? Uh, no, no. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, with the uh, with the RT group, if we if we have a group and 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 FIFO inside, and you relay rely on being scheduled in parallel, if you have this this audio example where we have a producer two filters and the consumer at the end. Um, then this might be tricky. Yeah, because so how do you reserve the bandwidth on the second CPU? Yeah, I mean, and that's the one of the points of discussion. So how it's implemented today is that you actually reserve the same amount on all CPUs. Yeah, but that's so bad. That's, that's bad. So yeah, we have to discuss so how but, to do but it. So but because this is a new thing, you can say, hey, we need to tell the, th the thing what maximum uh, uh, parallelism we get. Yeah, I mean, yeah, what's also Peter, I think, what was going to say, if, if the application doesn't really care about which particular CPU it wants to run on, then you can say, okay, I, I need, I don't know, 200% of bandwidth, that means two CPUs, right. whichever those uh, are, and then you can reserve just the, I don't know, force two CPUs to a, to a particular application, and if you have more, you can reserve the others. So it's the ma minimum amount of, uh, let's say, CPUs you need to actually fulfill your application requirements. That's right, uh, but, but then you should, then you could say, <coughs> you make the, if you, if you really want to do uh, affinity partitioning things, then you could require that the affinity is only settable on the, on the group itself. Right, yeah. That's and then inside the group, allow no 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 affinity manipulation yeah. because that's the group would be a reservation. <laughs> yes, so but then yeah. if you if you want to have it on a particular uh, set of CPUs, you have to to do the reservation for that particular set of CPUs. And this will work right until the moment you um, walk into the C group controller people. What? So the, the namespace people don't like this. Which is a great segue. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you. Hey, Peter. Uh, and, RT and Runtime and Share is on <laughs> in our okay. current one. Yeah. So basically what the answer of this is, we need a new scheduling class called Sched Ponies. Yeah, they should go away. Peter, that, Peter, that's easy to solve. They want time namespaces, and I only give them time namespaces if we get proper semantics for the containers.
told you. I was suspended. <laughs> Is it going through or? Plug the right thing in, or what? Hi, uh, my name is Prakash. Sorry about the glitch. So, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about the uh, specification we're running into with the, the DB use case. That's what I'm going to describe. And then uh, basically looking for suggestions and what direction we should take. Or maybe even avoid RT. What would be an alternative for that? Can we put the mic closer to your mouth? Okay, can you all yeah. hear me? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, stuff. All right, basically, um, so they're trying to run RT process inside user namespace, and like from the previous discussion, it was mentioned, uh, you can't run an RT with a user namespace. That is by, defi by design. Mm -hmm. um, so what are user names? I, I guess most of you know about it, uh, just to run through it. So uh, it allows any normal user to go and create namespaces, and, um, and using user names, you can create other, user, uh, other namespaces. And so with that, what you get is you can map a normal user to be UID zero inside the user namespace, which means they get all the capabilities, including capsules nice, but it is not effective in you know, letting a user set the RT priority and run RT processes. Um, yeah. And the capabilities are basically applicable to resources local within the user namespace. That is by definition. So the similar restriction exists for other capabilities like IPC lock, system time. You know, it won't allow the user inside user namespace to go change the uh, system time, um, nor make devices. Uh, the restriction exists even for a, a root user in the init namespace. If he gets mapped into user namespace, even that user will not be allowed to, you know, get these capabilities. Uh, so now the question is, do we deal with these case-by-case case basis. Well, we 
you know, if, if there are any use case where um, a user wants to be able to do some of these operations within the user namespace. Um, so like for example, for system time, there is the proposal for time namespace they're talking about. Hopefully that can address this particular requirement. If somebody wants to set up a container with the user namespace, then he may be able to set the time within the um, namespace with that, and I don't know where that is going, but. Yeah, yeah. We, we still have to talk about that, and we're going to, do, to have a session on, on Thursday afternoon. Okay. So whether the user is going to be allowed to do set time of day, I doubt it. But I mean, it would make, it would be possible, but it would make a lot of things more complex. Well, so with time namespace, the idea is to give uh, local time within the namespace. So yes, since you're I know, allowing. I know, but uh, the, the, the mess you're creating in the kernel for doing that, that's a totally different question. So I know what you want, but I mean, namespace people usually want p a lot of ponies. Okay. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so the discussion here is about RT. So I'm right. like, let's talk about RT, right? Uh, so basically, the use case basically here is you know we want to be able to run RT inside the user namespace. So I'll I'll go through the Oracle DB's use case specifically here. Um, so in the multi-tenant architecture. Uh, so they are going to start using user namespace to isolate a database instance on a particular system. There can be multiple instances. Um, so apparently there is similar restriction. There was very little discussion around, uh, you know, Linux containers. They now support unprivileged containers where basically you can, you're allowed to create namespaces using user namespace. Uh, but I, I didn't see any conclusion or a suggestion on how to deal with this particular problem. So uh, talking about uh, the DB use case, so what is multi-tenant architecture? Um, so it basically allows the Oracle database to be a multi-tenant container database. Uh, so I'll show a diagram next slide. Um, so where you can put multiple, they call it pluggable databases inside the container database. Uh, and that's how you can do consolidation. So with that, you can, you can have multiple CDBs or container database running on the same system. So now the question of isolation. So this is the architecture before uh, the co consolidation where basically the customers used to run these each instance, these are each instances running separately on different machines just because you want to keep them isolated. So with the, the new architecture, the idea is you create a container database which has a bigger database and then you put all the actual customer database inside that. And that basically helps you, you know, save costs and run multiple actual DB instances on the same system. Yeah, so because there'll be multiple CDBs running on the same system, now we need to be able to isolate each of them. And the solution we're looking at is to be able to use user namespaces plus other namespaces. Um, but now the CDB, the container database has some critical processes that have to run at a higher priority. And um, yeah, and so each PDBs are put in nested namespaces. That's the architecture basically. Um, so the critical processes have to run at a much higher priority than other processes in the system. Uh, so the, the current users to set them to run at RT priority. Um, but since now with use of user names, they're not able to set RT priority on these processes. So either, you know, the only solution that is available right now is to have a daemon running outside the namespace as root and then send a message and that would probably set the priority on these processes, which is not so convenient. <laughs> um, so what are the approaches we can take? Um, so basically, if you were to map the root user from init namespace into the user namespace, the question is, can we allow that user at least to be able to set RT priority? Or can we set, uh, allow Capsys nice capability if we were to tag or you know indicate that a particular user namespace has the ability to do this? 
or if there's any way we can do it with the help of C groups. If not RT, then what would be an alternate solution for this particular use case where you have critical processes that need to run inside the user namespace? Yeah, this is what basically, you know, that's all I had to ask. <laughs> any suggestions? Uh, in principle, yes. Uh, we surely can have some mechanism to allow that, but I would only ever go there if we have something like what, what we discussed before, um, the, the C group uh, bandwidth uh, control in place in order to just prevent non-privileged users from eating up uh, RT bandwidth. Right. I mean, so it, it has to come via the, the C group bandwidth controller anyway, right? Because that's, you don't know what user is going to get mapped inside the user namespace. Right. And the whole point behind, I mean, I don't know, Peter, I don't know when, when you did that, I think it was to prevent runaway RT processes from taking yeah. over. <laughs> <laughs> no, when you did the real-time CPC group stuff. Other stuff yeah, yeah it was just to prevent the real-time stuff from running away, right? Yeah. Um, like so, so any containerization of, of real-time needs limits on, on the runtime, because SCAT 5.0 is fundamentally buggered. It's, it's an absolute train wreck of an interface. Um, and, and a deadline server or a CBS server for FIFO per namespace or C group, whatever you have there, is required before we can allow any FIFO tasks to run inside right. of a container. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> I got Peter's. <laughs> so, okay, here's the thing. I, <laughs> the question I want to ask and you know, I, I don't have a good answer to is, is real time the right answer to this? As in, they want to use real time to, for log writer. Uh, the, the real question is, are user namespaces the right, right answer to the problem? Well, I mean, the reason they're using user namespaces is for isolation. Yeah, no. they've, they've decided to go, go that Yeah, way. if not user namespaces, then the, the trouble is you need to have root privileges to even create namespaces. That was one big advantage you'd get with user namespace. But so any user can just go create his own sort of I namespace and containers. I mean, now that's why they're using it. The, the question is, I mean, what can we do to avoid using real time? You, you should not really need real time to run a database, should you? No. So. Well, you're just trying so to make sure that the water runs. But you have some, some tasks which actually have higher priority, whatever you define it, whether that's, you name that real time or whatever, I don't care. <coughs> so yes, I, mean, I don't know. But, but all you have is nice over in CFS. Right. Nice it's not the most advantageous interface with CFS right now. I mean, all it does is <coughs> you get to run for longer, right? As opposed to to get run now. Yeah. So if we were to do a, a bandwidth server, the real time thing couldn't always run anyway. There would be limits on how much it can run. Um, so what are the requirements for this thing? Always yeah. running is, is not good. No, 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 that's, no, it's, that's not, a failure. it's not always running. It's basically the, the, the thing what they need to do is to run it immediately. Yes. And for a... <coughs> for finite period. You, you, can, you can put a runtime limit on it because okay. it's going to be finite. So what, what you want, you actually want the runtime limit in case that thing goes bonkers and runs forever. Actually, this goes back to one of the, yeah, this is 
going, this goes back to what I was trying to kind of say before. <coughs> I guess the issue is not having guaranteed runtime, but basically a limited runtime. So if we say, if once it goes in, you don't have to reserve time to make sure it has that available. Yep. But make, as soon as it gets scheduled in, then say, okay, make sure, like, now we want to add it to let it run and just limit it. So basically, like a bandwidth scheduler. You have, you have a sporadic server with, uh, with runtime limitation. Yeah, I think that's more, maybe I should describe it that way. Having more of a bandwidth scheduler that limits things instead Pardon? of guaranteeing things. Pardon? Yes, it has to run uninterrupted. That is the other thing. It's not like this is going to be a fixed time. It has to be run at a higher priority because it's a critical operation. You don't want to block that because if that blocks, then a lot of other processes behind it. Yeah, but, but I mean, you can't run it forever. Yes, that is the known thing. So, I mean, if, if there's a, the, the, the point is that we, when we want to allow uh, real time of any form inside of user namespaces, then we have to put uh, a, a RT runtime limitation on that. Sure. And that's something you have to define and say, okay, yes, I can do, or that thing, or the sysadmin can grant that. That's the person who grants it. Who says, "Okay, you can consume whatever twenty percent CPU for RT, but no, you're cut off hard if you try more." Okay, so, so I have a really stupid question, and this is probably for Peter. Uh, where are the current limitations with the the RT bandwidth limiter right now? That we can't plug it into user namespaces. I've never seen a namespace up close. I don't know. Okay. Also, we really want to get rid of that interface because it's shit. I You've I seen the presentations earlier I today, I right? agree, but yeah. are we sure we don't have any users? Well, no, but w we actually know there are users, which is why we want to. I don't know how it's plumbed with, with all the, the Yeah, I mean, the thing things. is, can yeah. there be something else? It, I mean, we probably have to avoid RT here. In this particular use case, you'll have multiple of these running on the system. So even if you were to carve out time, how much can you give to each of these right, from RT point of view? So. That's a good point here, right? With, with the whole idea of running multiple uh, PDBs and CDBs, you have a lot of these log writer processes, and so you probably don't have enough real time, well, enough real time time around to share. So real time is probably not, not the right way to go about it. And I think that's the question is what's the right way to go about it? <laughs> um, what you say is impossible. If there is not enough time, there is not enough time and it's broken, the end. There has to be some sizing. Obviously, you can't flood the system with so many. Yeah. You have to say, okay, max 10 or X. Right. Um, so, <laughs> and, and, but. Uh, the answer is VPS. <laughs> 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 but it's not me, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> where, where you come up with that? Sorry for those on video. <laughs> Yeah, but well that's not my problem, is it? <laughs> but uh, I mean, what? Yes. What do you? I mean, you really want a sporadic server with a, with a bandwidth limitation? Yeah. Yeah. Period. And sysadmin can say, okay, you get at max bandwidth for that crap. Whatever he defines, and then. If your stupid database locker needs more, then you need either to talk to the sysadmin or you need to look at why it's yeah. needing more time. So, yeah. and that's pretty much the end of the story. Yeah. 
then everything else you try, the alternative thing, if you try to basically do a new scheduling class, which is uh, kind of uh, fair, but uh, a little bit more unfair. <laughs> then you run into the same issue because uh, every other user will use scat ponies. <laughs> because his task is obviously the most important in the system. Well, of course it is. Yeah, we all know that. And I actually talked to database people who run even the, the other database thread in RT because it's more important. Yeah, no, I, I'm done. This is the last okay. slide. Yeah, but I think something like sporadic server with so runtime. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I got it. No, no, no. I am not working on it. There, work is being done uh, for what you need, but it's not there yet. And, and what is it? What called? is the work? Hmm? What's it called? Sporadic. Uh, it's it's the the hierarchical scheduling thing oh, okay. that Yuri and Daniel oh, so talked about. But, but yeah, but first we need all the other stuff that it depends for. But, but, but to, to have that, we need all the other thingies. The skid pony stuff. No, the no. ponies come last. <laughs> you cannot have a pony. <laughs> I want a pony. <laughs> you cannot have a pony. <laughs> Go into your room and lock the door and think about the pony. Okay. Well, it was last year that you got nailed by Peter. Just for one time, I not I should have let it go, but I was being nice. Uh, so there is no slides, right? So, so I'm going to go up there and do this one, or at least? Uh, it's, it's okay, so I'll give you a rest. That solves all problems in the world. <laughs> oh, actually, I don't know why I'm bringing this up. <laughs> Get us here. Okay, so the next one here, I guess, uh, it's officially Daniel proposed it, but uh, since he was already up, or, yeah, the other, uh, the tall Daniel uh, <laughs> proposed it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, not short Daniel. <laughs> so uh, basically uh, from there, if you, oh, hold on a second. Since I'm not in charge here, but so people can see. There we go. There's more. Yeah. So basically it's about what to do after a preempt RT is accepted because uh, what's the, ETA now? I mean, I, last I heard this was. Year, man. This year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the year of preempt RT. Uh, 42 real time. Uh, what is it? Uh, the real time galaxy time units from now. <laughs> well, uh, just to give a thing, I, I, people always, it's always been a run on joke that, you know, this year will be the year that RT is accepted. And to give you a little yeah, and, and that's roughly the same thing like the the year of the Linux the desktop. desktop. Yeah, and you know they've been saying this since what 2009? No, 2007. 2007? Yeah. yeah, 2007. So it's been about well, 11 years that we've been. This year is it. Um, the difference is no, actually, actually. Jonathan gave up on that. Yeah, John Garber because okay, I, I, yeah, he realized that he's not a prophet. Um, <laughs> but the funny part is he actually was true because every year. Uh, a large part of real time made it into mainline kernel. Uh, it was a constant feed. It wasn't, it's every year we actually got in, it was just actually, we started going in, it just is just taking a long time to finish it. So, we, you know, there's a lot of history. We've actually, the mutex code is actually from real time patch, believe it or not. Locktap came from the real time patch. Uh, timers, HR timers came from the real time patch. Ftrace came from the real time patch. So, all this stuff actually was in the real time patch first and was all pulled in. And now we're down to basically one or two things. Well, I know there, well, we got uh, software queues, I guess, is still being worked on. There's like another little things with software yeah, queues. I rewrote it the 10th time and I still hate it. Yeah, well, I, I, I like the last one. It's been pretty 
stable. I mean, it's been re rewritten several, several times. I think the last one hasn't modified very much, although there's, uh, Frederick Weisbecker has his work for the uh, starvation of soft IRQs. That's e, yes, and I was talking to him recently about that, and it actually makes it easier. Yeah. So what, because... What, to starve something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can do that without Frederick. Uh, or is it to lose something? Pardon? Or is it to lose something? Uh, no, yeah, that depends when Frederick's universe will actually collide with yeah. our universe again. Yeah. yeah, Frederick doesn't live in real time. <laughs> so, and then, and then the, after, I think the software cues and then uh, the sleeping spin locks, that's it, right? Is that the yeah, but th those are, that's the least of the worries because that's completely self-contained. Was it? Self-contained code. Self-contained. Self-contained, yes. Yes. So, yeah, but I'm so saying we still... So this is, this is the, 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 the part which I'm not worried about because that's the big chunk I throw at Linus and say, hey, take this, it's cool. Uh, but the, the other stuff which is preparatory work, that's, that's the, the thing which changes existing code. Right. Uh, what, so wait, but both preempt RT, but to get the sleeping spin locks, don't you need the, uh, well not the sleeping spin locks, but the prior, uh, yeah. To get the sleeping spin locks, I thought you needed all the other changes. Yeah. Yeah. Those little things that it touches and causes is the yeah, issue. Yeah. And, um, but we've always been looking at, uh, up until last year maybe, uh, all these talks for the real time microconferences and uh, the real time summits, where <coughs> basically I've always had a talk focused on what we need to do to fix X, Y, and Z so we could get real time, preempt RT into the real time, or get preempt RT into the kernel. Um, those conversations are over. We, ex we have a few things like locked in. We basically have ideas on how to get things. There's a few little nuggets, but for the last year or so, we've turned around and said, oh crap, we're almost there. We're ready. The conversation has turned to what do we do when the preempt RT patch is in the kernel? Because hey, we drink beer and then run away and turn Lots away. of beer. <laughs> Actually, that's the point where I'm going to collect all the peers people own me. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be a big party. Oh, yeah. So, Thomas, did you get your roadmap ready? <laughs> well, there's... Selling off all the beers. Yeah. So, the thing is, once it's in, it's actually not over. It's actually just the problems just change to something else. Uh, the few of the things we have to worry about is we have to teach people not to break real time. Because once it's in there, uh, developers will still are very... Um, uh, creative in breaking the kernel. And it's always, it's, you know, works for me, but too bad for you. So we need ways to do, well, there's a few things that we want to do. And one thing is, I didn't bring this up in your microconference, Daniel, was, uh, I should have done it, it was, okay, we need testing. We need a way to add to the K-self tests, to add everything else that, you know, when you run, like, every Linux next merge, they could run to make sure that real time still works and we test drivers, we test everything though, and maybe even um, uh, static analysis tools to analyze the kernel looking for things where you have something that's a local IRQ save thrown around that shouldn't always be done, make sure it's done properly. And maybe we should have rules about doing local, you know, disabling preemption, disabling uh, interrupts. So the main thing is if you disable interrupts and then call a spin lock, that will break on the preempt RT kernel because the spin lock is now a mutex and you can't disable preemption in schedule out, which mutex is due. Uh, so there's a list of things that we need to do now. So this is kind of a discussion of, you know, what can we do? Yes. How much of this can be caught by stuff like uh, locked up? Because I think locked up. Having locked up, that's a good question. How much can we do, uh, if you want to throw the mic back to uh, Peter? <laughs> he thought he was asleep during this one, huh? Um, so I have some locked up patches that do lock ordering things like um, make sure that you don't take spin locks under a raw spin lock and, and silly things like that. Um, but for timing, locked up cannot help. Locked up will destroy your timing anyway. Because, yeah. uh, um, so it, it can help with some patterns, but it cannot. I don't think we care about like, you know, locked up helping us with the, the uh, patterns. But I think what we worry about is that lockdep will catch, for example, uh, spin lock followed by uh, lockdep. Uh, uh, yeah, like a, like a like a raw spin lock followed by a spin lock, 
or local IRS. If you recall, like, you know, it's got to keep track of how a interrupts were disabled. Was interrupts disabled by a just a local IRQ save, and then you had a spin lock, which would be something rocked up could easily catch. Yeah. Did, okay. It move. Uh, yeah. It, it it's early. Are you going to yeah, sing like somewhere over the rainbow or something? Okay. <laughs> In the. <laughs> Show your best side. Okay. No, th that's not my best side. I'm not fitting in the camera with this. <laughs> okay. No. No. Uh, I get shy. So, with that model, I'm modeling also locks. Like, uh, I I'm modeling mutexes, which can be also real-time mutexes, and I say that I cannot uh, take a raw, I cannot take a real-time mutex after taking a a raw spin lock and such kind of thing. Like I cannot take a okay, I cannot take a real-time mutex with preemption disabled and preemption are disabled because raw spin locks disable preemption on that section, right? Yeah. We we can catch these problems. And this is the topic of the next presentation. But still, I, I would catch now with Trace. I would have to migrate these things to the kernel and things like that. This is one way to catch problems. But still, are very, very, like it's too early to say that uh, it's useful yet. Yeah. It's one way, but. <laughs> well, I guess my question then is, uh, Peter. You know, one of the things that we're talking about is is doing a preempt disable, and then trying to do a locking operation that's illegal. Can lock dev catch preempt disable because that's that's not a lock. Yeah, so lock dev currently doesn't do that. I mean, we can teach it. Um, well, we we have new tricks. Daniel, we, we yeah, also so we have the might sleep thing. And we also have uh, what's it called the new trace points that are in preempt disable and preempt enable, and we could maybe get get locked up to hook to the trace. Well, no, there actually is work to try to get locked up to actually touch or be part of those uh, Joel trace points. On yeah, Joel. Yeah. yeah, is he for here? Okay. Joel he's, is. Well, he. I mean, he's at the conference. I've seen him yeah. a couple times already today. Joel Fernandez, uh, Google. Yeah, he's doing. He's trying to get it so we get rid of the latency tracers. And have them be uh, have the basically the histogram code, uh, Tom Sanusi's code hook into that and be able to do more dynamic uh, latency tracing. So I think the was it? The mic, 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 mic. Well, right now we don't have those turned on by default. You know, just because of the weight. Of, yeah. of those guys. In yeah, the but well, that's another thing is I'm wondering if it's a possible, that's uh, how hard would it be to be able to do, um, get EBPF? the hooks into, <laughs> yeah, eBPF, <laughs> <laughs> to get the hooks into local IRQ save and I don't know, uh, this probably will never be production wise. Yeah. With wait, wait, wait. single instructions. Yeah. Their single <laughs> instructions is really no way, but ooh, we no, could. No, no, no. <laughs> that, that'll, that'll blow up your eye cache. <laughs> I know, I was just thinking about, you know, we do have the new uh, static calls that are going in now. I'm, I'm sure we can patch all it, but we need space to patch it and that'll blow up your eye cache. I mean, yeah, yeah, what I'm saying is that we can actually find a way to know where all the local IRQ say, like you know how alternatives work, but be able to do that at runtime. I mean, normal b after boot up. <laughs> well, no, no, it will be. Well, I'm saying either yeah. that or, or patch your uh, SDI and CLI with in three, and then. Well, that's right. Those <laughs> are, are those things? Yeah, are yeah. They're probably like single. <laughs> yeah, you probably couldn't do that. You'll have to extend the yeah the CLI and stuff. <laughs> <SDI>. <laughs> Uh, that's that's going to be a free nightmare. Right. But, <laughs> but the thing is, we don't need. <laughs> Let, let's not. Let's just not do this. Um. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but I'm saying is, do we need? Do we care if it can't be run on production? It's just something that we could. But. I, I don't care. 
Yeah, debugging tool. So if we turn on preempt enable the trace points, I mean, it does add overhead, but that's a debug kernel that you just run it. Because this is all about making sure, well, then again, the idea is to make uh, this has to be run on every like Linux next, next update to make sure that we don't have something added, at least for your use case. Why? I mean, we could, if, as long as it's run often enough, it doesn't have to be every Linux no, next update. No, no, yeah, but ideally you want to catch but it as soon as Sure, yeah, yeah, you want to catch it. But if every mm -hmm. Linux next update is not possible. Okay, well, my fear is this, is that you get someone who spent a lot of time designing something and ended up, you know, with this code in there and then, right, okay, then you then catch it afterwards, it, now you have well, to go back At to that it. point in time, Linux next is already too late. Yeah. You won't catch anything because they designed yeah. this m magic new facility and you're never ever going to run it because you, you don't even know that it exists. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Unless so you were able to do zero day bot that does everyone's get tree on kernel.org. So yeah, but, it's but pushed even, up there, you even catch the zero day bot will not find it because yeah. you have your new ma magic, newfangled uh, crypto, whatever this thingy, and you do not even have a, a, a user space which exercises that, or yeah. it's something you need uh, a, a network setup to, to actually use it. So it's, it's just not going to happen. So basically, it's just going to be treating it as a bug and say, hey, guys, you guys got to fix this. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. OK, so, so as Peter just said, same as might sleep, might yeah. uh, lock tip splats, and et cetera. So, so, so for a lot of the new stuff which people bring in, and even if, you, if, if somebody f fixed or enhanced the, the driver interrupt handler by doing magic mm -hmm. crap, then you won't hit it in the in the uh, in the CI because you don't have the device. Yeah. So the probability yeah. that you have the device yep. is pretty low. Right. So, uh, I mean, that's that's something we discussed back and forth over the years. Even in the in the regular kernel, we do not have the the coverage of all the gazillion of devices yep. out there because we don't have the machines. So it's not really locked up that we really need, but if we get like Smatch and, uh, you know, Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, static and, checkers uh, are static a checkers. Totally, totally different thing yeah. because the, you do not read, uh, need hardware for them. Right. So if we... Our documentation states that the developer should have preempt on, lock up on, all the other fancy schmancy stuff on when he writes new code. Of course, nobody does this. Right. Well, but the thing is, you could if you could have all that on, then you're not testing the uh, other cases either. You have to like compile it in different cases. Uh, that's normal. So, in for kernel CI, we've talked about adding more debug options. There's I couldn't actually find a list of the options that we should turn on. So, locked up is one of the more obvious ones. But uh, what what I think we should really have is a config fragment that turns on all the options that you would expect people to run, and then make it very clear type make uh, test config, test dot config bef when you do test it. Do, do we have um, a, because this is something that's come up previously on different topics other than RT is, do we have a way of like, uh, pro like I don't want to call it profiles, but uh, config type of thing? Like I want this type, I want a debug config. Give me a debug config. I want this type of config. Yeah, it's a KVM like a KVM config? Yeah, yeah, you can use merge, uh, there's a directory in the kernel tree, the name of which escapes me right now, with config fragments in it which you can merge in with merge config. So you say make uh, def config, blah, and then you merge in uh, like uh, KVM config, or there's a, there's a config that I put in there for um, disabling power management. So uh, you could do like make disable power management? And well, it, 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 it's not make disable power, but it, it's, you, you get a def config and then you merge in another. Well, we should make it part of the make config. Like, so we should say like make KVM config. Make well, yeah, but the, the, so the, tr the trouble on um, x86, that's, you only have def config and that, but on other architectures, you may have multiple config uh, base configurations you want to use. Uh, so maybe on x86, it makes sense to do that, but for, we, all, we do, do need people to know how to do the merging in of a config fragment directly as well. And you might also want to do, for example, KVM plus debug. Yeah, I like that. 
KVM config is a direct make target and it will merge the KVM guest yes. fragment into whatever config you have at that moment. And we can do something similar for debug config. Yeah. So then and then we should have an RT config. Yeah, then, then the you make uh, yeah, KVM someone config. Someone write that down, RT config. Debug <laughs> config and then you yeah. the, the combined, combined effort. Is that okay. <laughs> yeah, by the way, is there, before I know, I just want to make sure, is there anything else that we should be aware of, you know, that we need to, when, if, when preempt RT is in the kernel, what else do we need to do? I mean, is there anything that we would have to be aware of to make sure, like stable backports and stuff like that, we are still going to have the stable trees available for the real-time stuff, but. Yeah, probably for a while. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, Documentation. Yeah. 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 I, I was about to say that because uh, when uh, preempt is in the upstream kernel, we will need to advise people to avoid locking this way or that way, avoid doing this or that. So yep. documentation is quite important. No more try lock loops. Do we get rid of them all? <laughs> no. No. <coughs> we should make a try lock loop like crash the kernel. I mean, just get rid of them all. Yeah, no, no. we are waiting for that magic proxy execu execution stuff. <laughs> I mean, come on. I, I really have to, to, to mimic Andrew Morton here. We're talking about this thing for more than 10 years now. Can you please get it done? <laughs> I think we switched over to. I wasn't as mean as Andrew. Andrew would have said, it can't be that hard. Yeah, you switch. Continue with See, you're the one in charge of this one now, right? Oh, so you don't want to talk. <laughs> He's tired. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, like I said, we only have to uh, another 16 minutes. So, because I think we all want, because, by the way, tab elections are uh, today. <laughs> so, did you want to come up here and uh, uh, continue? <laughs> yeah, what, what, what now? Is, uh, how to catch problems that break preempt RT. So, this is kind of like a segue into it. <laughs> I, I, I will never propose so many topics next time. <laughs> Yeah, it was Steven's fault. Well, where is the HDMI? Well, it's blame roasted. That's his key. Yeah. Hey, here we are again. Those red slides again. So <laughs> my red, my, my t-shirt still is red. So, and I'm proud of it. So, um, how do we catch? How can we catch problems that can break the preempt RT preemption model? And here comes Daniel again with his theories. And uh, so. What is the main preempt RT feature? Is the preemption model, is that option that we enabled it, the fully preemptive kernel. And um, our preemption model tries to make the kernel as, as preemptive as possible, but still we can disable and enable preemption on demand. And uh, okay, the preemption model is we can enable disable preemption on demand, and we have some code with if therefore. And uh, we have a, we have a more or less the same uh, lock assumptions for the non RT kernel, but we have different locks, and the position of the locks change. So, how do we catch problems on the RT nowadays? Like we have this scheduling while in atomic warm, we have a lock depth telling us that we have a problems. So we have a lot of fragments of checking, 
but they are not a, a single tool that check if the parameter T model is being respected. So um, what, how, what, how can we change these fragments of a check into a something that tells us that we have a problem or that we are breaking the parameter T model? So we need a formal model, a formal model that checks the parameter T. Yeah. And um, something I I would like I will pursue it this year. It's not something I have done, but something that I will work on. It's using that model that I present. Try to make a way to catch if uh, a change in the kernel or a new version of the kernel breaks that model, because. While I was developing the model, I was trying to catch problems in the model, right? Because my modeling was wrong because the kernel, I assume the kernel is, is right. But once we have a problems on kernel, we will have a, a difference between the kernel and the model. The problem can be in the model, but after some time, the problem will start to show up in the kernel when we break something. And uh, the model that I have now, it's for single core. I will work for SMP this year, but it also works for most of the problems, uh, ignoring just the fact of migrate disable and the raw spin locks, but still, it, it works fine, even for SMP already. So just give one example. This is the model that explains when we can call the scheduler and the, the sufficient and necessary conditions to call the scheduler. After I'm switch in, I, I start to running, right? I can uh, set my I can set my state to sleepable and be sleepable. If uh, I receive a need rescheduled, for example, I'll be sleepable but having uh, being preempted. And so th these are the states in which we can have the is in which we can call or not call the scheduler and uh, the state that brings me. So some time ago, I was while I was was modeling, I catch this tra I got this trace. So the key worker was switched in. It starts run. So the task was set to sleepable itself. While it was in the sleepable state, while calling on the way to call the scheduler, and set need reschedule was set. It was about to be preempted and then it called the scheduler. By calling the scheduler, it uh, was preempted because need reschedule was set and another key work started to run. Uh, after some time, this key, the previous key work, this one I'm tracing here, it was awakened and then it uh, returned to the execution. But right after returned the execution, it called the scheduler again and then it uh, the scheduler was called, but there was no schedule switch because the thread that was leaving and the thread that was entering was the same. So this was, wait, that sounds odd. Following the, my model, uh, we, get, we have these, these state changes. Like I was set to run, running, and then uh, sched, uh, I read here, sched switch in, I was running, state running. Then set sleepable, state is sleepable. And then need rescheduled. Okay, I was going to be preempted in the sleepable state. Then the scheduler was called, still in the same. Need rescheduled. Okay, need rescheduled in the same. Sched entry in the same. The, but while I was out of the CPU, the sched waking arrived, and so I'm preemption to runnable. And then I sked switch in and I am running. While running, I call the scheduler. And so, wait, I'm calling. When I have this, I'm calling the scheduler in vain. So why am I calling the scheduler in vain? I can be calling the scheduler in vain if this transition here, the need resched takes place into a interrupt. If I'm going to, I'm, I'm leaving the CPU by myself, like the set is, the, the task is leaving the CPU because it's going to sleep. And while going to sleep, 
Before I call the scheduler, I interrupt come, and it causes a preemption. And this, and then we can arrive here and call the scheduling in vain, but th it, this is okay. The problem is that in the case that I've, I was running here, it was the problem of this patch. While, while going to call the scheduler, I was running this sketch submit work, and uh, during this I do a wake up and I suffer, I do a wake up, set need reset. When returning to preempt enable, I, I would check that need reset is, was set and the scheduler was called. But the scheduler here was called while it was, I already was on the way to call the scheduler. And so this, this brings me to that case in which I was, here I, I, I suffered the contact switch and then when I returned this tag, I would call the scheduler again. So, and this is an inefficiency. I don't need to call this back again. All right, I, or I would not need to call here because I know I'm going to call the scheduler. So, in this, okay. In this case here, the scheduling be called in the vein was a problem. And uh, the model helped me to catch it. And it turned out, it turned out that this, this patch was bring me to, to this inefficiency problem and I suggested the fix. It's just okay. As I know that I'm going to call the scheduler, I don't need to call the scheduler here. And this was one case in which the model helped me to catch the. Did, okay, just to, to finish there. The model helped me to catch okay. one problem, so, yeah, but so there are still many problems that the. I just wanna make sure I got this. So you ran the model here and, and how did, did, you, were, did the model point out that, um, that issue in this trace or? Okay, I was yeah, how, using yeah. here, I was using trace points, the trace points were being captured using perf, mm -hmm. and the perf in user space was loading the automata and comparing the trace with the automata. When one, not one event that is not expected takes place, it... Uh, so basically, that the, your model didn't have that uh, weird thing and then pointed out that they actually have something happened where you're like, wait, that my model doesn't have us doing this. Yeah, and so in this case, the model was pointing that an odd case was happening, which is calling the scheduler when I am in a runnable right. state. Okay. Yeah, but I, I guess the, the point maybe is that you saw it. We didn't have an automated tool. No, Perf saw it. No, I'm saying, well, yeah, something, I mean, it came out and said, oh, there, I'm like saying you had your ran through your model and something came out and said, hey, I found an anomaly. I mean, yeah. that, that was okay. automated. Now, yeah, what, what I'm doing now is that I have a Perf plugin which is the perf task model. Right. And uh, it enables the trace points and the load, okay, I'm. We're jumping it, ahead. It looks for anomaly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just, uh, just a second, I, I will open up paper. I didn't realize so basically the, the thing you're doing is you're modeli oh, yeah. modeling what you expect, then running a bunch of traces and then seeing if there's anything that breaks what you expect and then you analyze it to make sure, hey, that oh, I just didn't know this case, which is a legitimate case, or wait a minute, this is actually something, it's not broken, but it shouldn't really happen. And like in this case, it wasn't really broken, it was just an inefficiency. What I'm doing now, like on the modeling, what I'm doing now is that I have the model here and I have the tracing. I have a validation tool, which is perf, that loads the automaton in the graphics format and gets the perf data tracing and tries to run the automaton with the perf data. When one unexpected event takes place, it prints me, okay, I have this, on this state, I received this event and this is not expected. And it shows me the trace of events that brings me to that state and so I can analyze the code. That, that, that's how it's automated. And, uh, but now I'm using this on using Okay, it's not more a sorry Peter's sister because he already knows. So. Now I'm doing this using perf with trace points. I collect all the data 
put it to user space, load the model, and uh, compare the model against the execution, and it starts prints me the output, saying, okay, I received on this event, on this date I received this event, it puts me on this other event, and so on. When one event takes place on a state in which it's not recognized, it prints me the, out the error, and so it points me the cause of the error. Uh, I'm, the problem is that like on 30 seconds of trace, on a single core, I was generating 2.5 gigs of data, and that's a huge amount of data because I'm tracing all print disable, all print enable, all local queue enable, all local queue disable. So it's a large amount of trace. So, so the, ju just to finish up, even though it's a large amount of trace, I was being able to analyze it well because with the model, all the events from the kernel are analyzed in O of one. So it's, it's uh, linear time, it's efficient. So I could analyze 2.5 gigs of data in less than eight seconds while analyzing the, while running the model. So the complete model integrated those more than 10,000 states are analyzed in O, o of one for each event. It, each event of the kernel generates just one move in the, in the automata. And that's why it's efficient for checking. And, uh, but yeah, this, this is not, uh, okay, I was doing everything in user space, but my question here was already responsive. Where should I move? Because doing this in user space, it's, it's causing me to take a lot of data, extracting a lot of data from the kernel. But now that we, we can use trace hooks, yeah, we can use trace hooks, and then I can work in the kernel, not collecting all the data, but just recording the last, uh, from the initial state until the problem, I will record because I will be able to trace from like uh, when IRQs are enabled, parameters are enabled, everything is fine, until the problem, I will start the trace, and then um, the other problems, I will start to throw away and do things inside the kernel. And uh, that's something I, I, I am, I will work on my free time in the next year. It's part of my PhD, so I, I need to do it anyway. Thomas just wanted to know where the eBPF plugin is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pay me a beer that I will show you. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I will need to use BPF, but with hooks, we can use BPF, we can use perf, we can use everything. That's why I'm, I'm happy with hooks. And uh, what do you guys think? I don't know. I'm in big in the states, big. In How do you use a container database? <laughs> okay, the size of the dot file, like in the textual format, it's around the two megabytes, but it's in textual format. If we remove these strings and put in a binary format, it will be reduced, but I never reduced. It still is some, some megabytes in the very verbose format. I need to, we can, okay, I load this model in the dot format using the graphviz, which is an open source tool. So they already have this representation in a data structure. I need to check the size of data structure. Turn around. Daniel. Question: <laughs> How can we reduce your search space? The the amount of data you're collecting. What can we do? The amount of data I collect, or the number of states? Uh, both. The trace points that you're picking up right now. I mean. No, if we so do the, I collect all the data, and the data is a lot of. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and uh, now I'm collecting everything and put into user space, but I don't use all that information, right? So if we do in kernel space, I will reduce the amount of data I will need to, to, to deal. Uh, okay. But so the number of the states of the model, it is what it is. Uh, if the, the model is uh, you know, uh, very fixed, uh, we can uh, make it in, we can make, uh, I think that uh, you, you'd better to make it inside the, the kernel, like a uh, lock dead. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, get like it. Like lock dead. Like locked up, make it inside the kernel, like locked up, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, we could add some functionality in there. Uh, oh. But that's going to, let's take this offline because it's time for, uh, 
it's, it's over. So thank you everyone for showing up. And, uh,